ask you something? Do you really like working on Kane stuff? You really like busting people? Yeah. I bust frauds, I bust parties. I love it. Have you ever busted anyone you know? Yeah, I tried it. That makes a difference. See, in my business, you soon find out that everybody's capable of it. Think of it, they've done it. Yeah, but think of the upside. This doesn't leave me too much to be disappointed in either. Thank you.
What's up, everyone? Thank you for sticking with me through those intense problems, dude. I've never had boomer tech and problems like that before. Hope everybody's doing well on this Labor Day weekend in America, in the United States of America. Hope everyone's doing well. I don't know what I'm doing. <clears throat> My uh, faux Cockney accent on Labor Day. What is, what, what's Labor Day? Please tell me in the chat, what's Labor Day? <clears throat> is this the day that you rest from your labors, or is this... Um, you know, older people used to always confuse uh, Memorial Day with Labor Day. <clears throat> I never had that problem because y'all can hear me all right, right? Because I took forever. Side note, I know you don't care about this. You don't want to hear this. But um, <clears throat> the uh, zero BS froze. Then I had to restart it. Then I had to do an update. That took forever. Then the Internet froze. Then the Internet went all the way out. Uh, didn't even work on the phone. I don't know why everybody would be on it right now or if that makes a difference. Maybe it's the uh, <clears throat> cyber polygon. And then uh, then the camera froze, then the audio froze, then the microphone had to be replugged in. Whatever, man. Annoying problems, and I've never had it like that before. So thank you. Cheers. Thanks to everybody for sticking around. Appreciate it. And uh, especially on this bank holiday Monday night, I guess, I suppose. Um. I just decided on a whim on a whim to do this because I think somebody brought up uh, JCVD Jean-Claude in one of the last streams, and then I was thinking about Gemini. I was thinking about the Gemini archetype, and so I decided to watch Double Impact because when I was younger, Double Impact, the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, was the, <clears throat> the one that stuck with me, which is kind of a weird choice because everybody always goes to, you know, Lionheart in those, um, but I really like this movie and rewatching it. I've seen it a bunch of times, but rewatching it, um, I thought it was even better. And one thing that really surprised me was the, the acting of all things, because, um, you know, JCVD as he's known now, I guess, I don't know. Van Damme, <clears throat> um, plays dual roles. Obviously he plays twins and I thought he was really good. My sort of bar for that was whether I believed him or not in the roles. And at one point I forgot that I was watching the same actor. You know, you, you start to have the willing suspension of disbelief as who says that Keats Coleridge circle G drops 
five bucks in a super chat. Thank you. And says, it's summer 1998. You're 10 years old. You got pizza, Doritos, and Coca-Cola. Face Off is on the HBO preview weekend. Life is great. Yes, life is great. Life was great <clears throat> pre-Big Nine. Um, it's interesting you say 10 years old in 1998. <laughs> I was 18. Well, I guess summer of 98, I was 17. Um, but yes, life was great. And uh, when I was 10, though, when I was 10 years old, those memes always get me because I would always spend the summer with my my old friend, one of my oldest friends. Uh, shouts out to Brad. That's all I'll say. But um, shouts out to Brad. We'd always go to the farm, and uh, that's exactly what we would do. And, you know, Blockbuster, uh, tons of, of tapes for the whole uh, time. We'd be there. I'd stay for like two weeks, and we watched the movie One Crazy Summer probably five million times over the course of many years. It's kind of a classic um, and it reminds me of that place. So, yeah, shouts out to Brad out there. One crazy summer. Of course, um, his mom would always get, what is it? Girls just want to have fun for his sisters. <laughs> and so we would always take that out and watch. But we still, for, for, you know, I still managed to watch that movie, though, over the course of all that time. Um, but, yeah, One Crazy Summer, John Cusack, Demi Moore, right? Bobcat Goldweight. Great soundtrack. Classic 80s, kind of a forgotten movie. But this movie, uh, Double Impact, is is actually great. It's it's a it's a good movie. It's produced by Van Damme. And it's got uh, Jeffrey Lewis, who is Juliette Lewis, the actress Juliette Lewis, <clears throat> who plays Mallory. Mallory in uh, NBK, Natural Born Killers, remember? Wayne Gale, Highway 666, remember? Um, when that movie... Shouts out to uh, Kuski because I don't think he's, that's the one movie he always talks about that he hasn't seen. <laughs> Great Oliver Stone movie, but that has nothing to do with what we're doing tonight. Tonight we're doing um, Gemini. We're talking about Gemini, the, uh, the Gemini archetype, uh, archetype, Gemini twins. And the reason I'm doing this is because this is another one in film and literature that we've mentioned and discussed so many times as a motif but we really haven't gone into the origins of it. And from the beginning of this whole channel, that's one of the things that I, one of the reasons that I said I was doing this to go back to the, uh, the, the literary origins of these tropes and motifs and, and, and phrases and quotes and all these things that are used in the zeitgeist in the media, you know, and by politicians and all this stuff. So this is a good one to go back to. And in fact, I kind of think now um, that it ranks almost up there with, the go-to themes, especially in film, especially in Hollywood, that we've mentioned so many times. We've, you know, Gnosticism is a, that's what, like every movie. So Gnostic themes, right? The prison planet, the Demiurge uh, breaking out of the, you know, uh, the shell, crossing to the other side. Um, so Gnosticism, and then what we covered last time, which was the most dangerous game. I think we did a good job on that one because we went, we spent some good time uh, on the short story and I also talked about it on the on what is it two different shows this week on TNT Radio, so that was cool. And shouts out to that crew and to Hesher and Ruckus and Boiler Room crew for um, you know uh, arranging that. So that was cool. And so this one, the Gemini Twins, is interesting because we see uh, what I realized. Uh, so we're going to go back to Edith Hamilton's mythology, which is kind of you know I think this is the go to thing um, to discuss this. I'm on a delay here, by the way, so it's kind of, you know, freaking me out because the chat and the video are, like, still messed up on OBS. So if I if I kind of, I don't know, if I glitch a little bit, it's because of that. So my bad. But anyway, let's get past that. Um, if audio is good and video is good, please let me know if there's any problems so that I can fix it because I'm doing my best here. So thank you for sticking with me. I appreciate you all. Um, the other thing uh, is that Castor and Pollux, the uh, Gemini twins, the mythological Gemini twins, go to the description of this stream, and you'll see what I mean, um, are mentioned in the uh, Jason and the Argonauts, which is Apollonius of Rhodes and the Voyage of the Argo. So we're going to look at this, and we're going to look at Edith Hamilton's mythology. We're going to talk about that, and then we're going to go to uh, these two or sorry, these three films, one of which is, of course, where Castor and Pollux actually show up literally as characters, and that's Face Off. Take, you want to take my, my face off? Wait, wait, let me get this straight. You want to take your face 
off, says Nick Cassavetes, who's the son of the, the infamous Cassavetes who appears in the Roman Polanski film, right? Um, this is a great movie, by the way. We're going to spend some time with this tonight, Face Off. I know it's been covered by lots and lots of people. Uh, the best was, of course, by J.D. Because um, it's got Cage Rage in it, who's in top form. Um, we're going to talk about the film because there's a lot in this um, that, I well, for one, that I didn't mention before. The best part was that Mr. Jangles himself appears. Remember, we talked about Mr. Jangles in, uh, was it, that was the Hesher stream. We talked about the film Hesher. And Mr. Jingles <laughs> from the one season of American Horror Story that I watched, which was Camp Redwood 84. Speaking of which, we probably need to go back to that sometime in the future because, you know, it's it's got the Night Stalker. It's a good, it's a good sort of campy, satirical uh, season. The other ones I don't know about, and I've, I'm not really interested. But um, Idol only plays one way, full throttle. Nightcrawler is a Billy Idol fanatic, but Mr. Jingles is with him. That's the guy who plays the the prison guard in Face Off. Let me see if I can find a picture. I don't have a picture of him. Um, and then we're going to talk about this movie that I don't know if any of y'all have seen this. If, has anybody seen this? Gemini Man. It came out in 2019, and it's uh, Will Smith himself, who's kind of the you know he's kind of the go one of the go to guys for sci fi films, right? He's in so many. Will Smith and uh, Tom Coombe, of course, kind of trade off in these roles. Who was it? Will Smith was an I'm legend, but who was it they were going to get if they couldn't get him? Was it Tom Coombe? Tom Coombe, I don't think it was Keanu Reeves. Um, anyway, whatever. He's he's uh, in I'm legend, which I talked about with Hesher. We might get him to do uh, an analysis of that sometime soon, that and um, Snowpiercer. But this is a good film because... It, even though it's 2019 and deep fakes and, you know, face swap was already around this, this movie really makes it a, a key element in the narrative and does a pretty good job. I mean, the director's Ang Lee who uh, felt that he was, um, you know, stiffed. Oh, that's an unfortunate word to use in the context of the movie he was stiff for, which was um, uh, what's the name of that movie? Um, I can't quit you. Right. Jake Gyllenhaal, Heath Ledger. I quit. I can't quit you, babe. And the horses look in the tent. Oh, don't look in there. Remember that family guy? Um, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, broke, the broke cowboy, right? The broke-ass cowboy. Um, Ang Lee. Um, Ang Lee's done a bunch of – he has done a, a few great films. He did uh, – well, he also did that Hulk with Eric Banner. Did you guys see that one? I actually thought that was the be one of the best of those movies before the big – Sort of a renaissance, I guess, of Marvel movies. I like Eric Bannon. But anyway, I digress. Um, it also, going back to, you know, yeah, so Face Off has the, we're going to take the face off, which is uh, clever. I mean, this is a clever movie. They literally take their faces off, so they switch persona, right? Their face becomes a mask, and they sort of gloss over how they have to change the bodies. But, you know, it's a, it's a movie. It's kind of, this movie is kind of what, movies are supposed to be in that it's fantastical and it has predictive and revelatory elements, but it's campy and kind of, you know, action driven. Uh, we can kind of skip over the symbolism of, Oh, the doves pop out of nowhere, you know, all that stuff like that's been done to death. Uh, to me, that's kind of low hanging fruit. The movie is good because it's got sort of predictive big nine elements. It's got the international tourist. It's got the, Panopticon uh, prison, the floating prison ship, which, by the way, um, if you have read recent articles, uh, is a thing. Apparently, the ghost card has uh, floating prison ships for people that they've fought in the uh, WUG drawers. <laughs> I know I don't need to do all that, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, the people that they've interdicted and they have these big uh, cartel people and apparently they put them on these floating uh, prison ships, which is kind of a holdover from, you know, the, the war on terror, the black sites, and they're outside jurisdiction. So they're technically not, um, you know, on trial or even, I guess, under arrest until they hit U.S. soil. But I've got a few articles of that, if I can even pull them up which I thought was interesting. I know that people have known about this for a while, but I was just interested to just find these in a simple search from 
big uh, MSM sources. But uh, first, let's start off by talking about uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, the, the Belgian uh, uh, karate uh, superstar <laughs> in his movie, Double Impact. So first of all, have you guys seen this movie? If you've seen this movie, uh, why don't you put a karate man in the chat? <laughs> He's in his gi. And I think actually, you know, out of all of the karate superstars and all, all the action stars, Jean-Claude Van Damme is, is supposedly the most authentic in terms of his actual experience. I know we've done Steven Seagal. Go back to that stream. We did an awesome Seagal stream. But he's, you know, he's an, uh, Seagal is, of course, an Aikido master, a uh, Phoenix program, Vietnam Navy SEAL specialist, um, a uh, Louisiana sheriff, a musician, a rock star. He's just an all-around, you know, renaissance man. He did that, Rachel pointed out recently, he, he even specializes in Jamaican, you know, Rasta music. He's got that one song. His band is called Thunderbox, which, by the way, sounds cool, but do you, does anybody know what that is in British parlance? Um, that is going back, uh, what is it, back to, I guess it would be the Victorian era. A thunderbox is a term for, you know, that, that's the reason they called it a John. Remember in Men in Tights? All the toilets shall henceforth be called John. That's, that's what that is. I don't think that he knew that when he did that, but it sounds cool, you know. Um, my band in middle school is called purple stuff. That was pretty cool <clears throat> from a Sonny D commercial. First, we were called atomic finger, which I thought was a badass name because it had atomic in it. And I got it from a Tom, uh, Ned's atomic dustbin. Anyway, Jean-Claude Van Damme is cool. He's also, you know, he's troubled in his personal life. Um, but he's, you know, he's campy and stuff. And actually I thought he was not very cool back in the day. You know, I thought it was just this European accent, you know, does a lot of splits, all that stuff. But now that I'm older, I can see that it's just kind of, he, he kind of trolls himself, right? He's kind of a troll of the trope. And I think that's kind of cool. You know, um, he's just like having fun. And, uh, you know, apparently RL, he was, he was a good uh, martial artist. I guess he had to be. I mean, you know, he does the stuff. He got he got them thighs. He got thighs like a like a thoroughbred. Apparently, um, remember he did that commercial, that Super Bowl commercial. He was like doing the splits with the the Mack trucks. I mean, that's funny, right? That's just that you know, it's it, it's funny. It's whatever. He's got that meme dance. That's pretty badass. He got some swag. So this movie is double time. Jean Claude Claude Van Damme. All right. So here's what the movie's about. Um, here's what happens. So. Uh, there he is, double impact. He's got his leather jacket. There's actually three of them there. And you can tell the difference uh, between the two Van Dams because one has slick back hair and the other has just regular hair. <laughs> it's pretty simple. There are also, by the way, there are points in this film where you can see um, the little green screen like glow around the regular Van Dam, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, watching this back in the day, nobody probably noticed, but I just noticed, you know, cause I was spurging out over the movie. Also, um, before I forget in face off, there are a few scenes where you can clearly see people like on wires, like, so they're running, they're on wires and then they get punched in the face and then they, you know, go, they get shot backwards and you can actually see the wires. And, uh, it's really, really obvious. And I thought that was... <laughs> But I thought it was funny because uh, I guess because I saw that um, they were doing that for World Peace 2. I saw them filming, you know, Sam and Nick filming the same sort of thing for World Peace 2. And I thought it was kind of cool. Um, but this was, you know, in the midst of like the wire martial arts and all that stuff that, you know, was so big, I guess, in Asia. And they were they made it big here and, you know, Mission Impossible 2 and The Matrix and, you know, uh, Crouching Tiger. I guess Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon um, was the you know, big time genesis of that here, I guess. Um, and uh, I think that movie is, ve is very, very good. I really like that movie, um, which is kind of surprising. It sort of came out of nowhere, I guess. But anyway, all right, so, um, so Double Impact is interesting because it begins with uh, the Gemini as twin infants. They're infants. And 
uh, we see that there is a ribbon cutting ceremony at a new tunnel. Now we've seen all this so many times. There's always, uh, there are always nefarious things, esoteric things, and you know, weird stuff with these tunnels. There's the Gotthard uh, tunnel ritual. There's the goat people in the pan that come out. There's like, this always happens. And um, I, I guess the, the, the ritualistic symbolism is, it, it can't be that obvious, right? That they're just going into the earth. So they're like, they're doing rituals and these dances to symbolize, uh, you know, unification of nature and people, I guess. I, I mean, what is this? Why is it always like this? Now, it's not like that in, the, in this movie. Um, they, they built a tunnel under the Victoria Harbor in Hong Kong. And um, there, there is a ribbon cutting ceremony, but it's sort of more formal. They do have a, a kind of a ri ritual, you know, but it's, it's mainly just a Chinese dance and song and stuff. So on the surface, it's pretty, I guess, you know, par for the course. Um, and of course, that would, you know, symbolize the, the unification between the Anglo world and the Chinese world um, going into business and just everything. Right. So this is pre handover. The handover happened in what? When was the handover? 90, I think it was 98 was the handover. And this movie is like in the, when is this movie? Double impact. Is this is this late eight? It's got to be like ninety, I think. Hold on, sorry. Ninety, yeah, ninety one. Okay, so it's ninety one. Handover was in ninety eight. I remember the handover because um, because I read about it in ninety eight when I was at the breakfast table. I would always read about it uh, in the newspaper before I went to school, and I was interested also because the last. Govern, governor, governor of Hong Kong, the last um, British governor was an, he was in Ulsterman, and I think he went to Queens. Uh, what was his name? Chris. Somebody looked that up. What was the last governor of Hong Kong, the English governor, during the handover? And he, I remember he had two daughters that were my age. Um, anyway, so uh, and and years later, by the way, I got to go to Hong Kong for a few days, and that was um, if you've been to Hong Kong you'll know. I mean, it is, it's amazing. It's, it's so strange. It's like, it's like Blade Runner in real life, but it's a complete, you throw, you know, old uh, English sort of early 20th century, modern architecture and culture and a way of life completely against a traditional Chinese way of life. And the two just sort of stand right next together and it creates this weird, it's like, it's a very weird place and very cool. Um, it's, it's a lot like New York in that, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first person Q, uh, Chris Patton, that's it. Um, in that it doesn't sleep and they're like blade runner, you know, parts to it. Like, especially in Kowloon, um, Kowloon had that, you know, mega cube city that had like, you know, 10 million people living in it. Um, that was already gone when I got there, but Kowloon was interesting because I didn't know when I got there that most of Hong, what we think of as Hong Kong is actually on the mainland and is Kowloon. And that like Hong Kong itself is just one part of the island. I guess the rest of the island is like a nature reserve or it's something, but only one part is taken. And um, I had a friend in drama school who grew up there. He was an expat. His dad was a, you know, in shipping or something. Um, and it's beautiful. It's amazing. They got the harbor right in the middle. It's the old, you know, the old boats that cross. There's, there are these weird, like, uh, you know, future, um, future skyscrapers. There's one that like looks like a praying mantis, and apparently they don't like it because it violates uh, feng shui, and because of the lines. Let me see if I can find this. The oh, <laughs> well, that's the Belfast skyline. For no reason. Um, but look at that while I pull up Hong Kong because that's a good that's a good contrast, especially because the governor was an Ulsterman. And of course it's set in Hong Kong because this is uh Jean Claude Van Damme and martial arts. And see all these pictures make it look so much bigger than it is. Um, it's really cool. It's like, it's like skyscrapers all just like jumbled together in this one 
small part, but then when you're at the base of them, it's at least when I was there, it was all um like traditional English, like these, you know, they have these red taxis. And uh the taxi drivers all wore like white suits and shorts and um it's really cool because because it's you know it's older and it's an interesting culture right which is different from what uh these um globalists want which is you know d i v e r s it everywhere they want you know if you live in new york and you go to london they want it to be the same everywhere so it's everything is every culture whereas you go to london because you, you want to see the tower you want to see the crown jewels um you know, you want to see English culture. When you go to Hong Kong, you want to see what they've done. So, come on, dude. There we go. All right, let me minimize this. Let's see if we can check this out. This is cool. This is I'm just, I'm taking the time to show this because this is, to me, this is one of the great cities in the world. And I got so much out of it. I went alone. I was living in Malaysia for a summer. And I took like a very cheap flight there. It took about, I don't know, an hour. And I stayed in like, here we go. You can see this. There you go. Look at that. It looks like, I mean, I guess that picture makes it look like any other sort of, you know, it looks like any, especially any mega, you know, a Chinese new century city now. But like, it's right on the harbor. It's really cool. Um, all the people were very friendly. Of course, everyone speaks English there. It was just post handover a few years after that. So it was still very, there, there was a lot of, you know, English influence. It was like old world and new world all in one, you know, one thing. Um, and in a way it's a lot like Singapore because, um, even though Singapore is, you know, has uh, a lot of colonial influence, it's very, uh, independent. It's very just Singaporean. Um, and when I went to Singapore, the one thing that is memorable that happened, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, is that I was on the subway there, on their tube, and uh, I had, like, some sort of, like, sweet, like a candy bar or something, something I never usually eat. But I was starving from the trip, and I unwrapped it and took one bite, and the entire train turned and, and looked at me. And then I asked somebody there, like, what's the deal? And they were like, you need to, like, put that in your backpack right now. Don't, don't take, you can be arrested for it. And I was like, oh, fuck. There's no gum. There's no sweets. Nothing is, nothing like that is sold in Singapore. And you can tell because it's extremely, uh, it's extremely tidy, extremely clean. And um, last thing I'll mention is that uh, one more thing about Singapore since I'm on this little train is that uh, I've mentioned this before, but remember in the 90s, they had that news story about the, you know, bratty American kid who was the son of some businessman and he was like graffitiing something and he, he was convicted and he was sentenced to like, to be caned. You, you guys remember that? The caning? And he appealed to uh, El Presidente Bubba himself to try and get out of it and Bubba would not intervene. Well, what I learned uh, when I went there was that... <laughs> Uh, caning is not, uh, caning is not how we think of it. Like, you know, in the old days, you, you know, in the 19th century at school, right? You go on and pick out your own switch and then we're going to whip like that kind of thing. It's not like that. It's, it's, um, it's a giant, uh, like bamboo thing called a rotan. I think I'm pronouncing it right. And there's a dude like in medieval times, they had the executioner. This guy is the caner and they tie you up and they, they, hit you with this thing in your, like in your stomach. And they were like, yeah, it breaks your rib cage. And then it takes a year to recover. So three strokes of the Rotan is like a three year sentence of recovering and then getting broken again. I was like, damn. Okay. Uh, well, well, I wasn't going to graffiti before. That's weird to go somewhere and gra like, you're going to go to Singapore and graffiti. The That's, that's a weird of all things. Right. Well, whatever. Anyway, so that's that. So, okay, so let's get back to the movie. So um, we're going to do this movie. Then I'm going to talk about uh, Edith Hamilton mythology. Then I'm going to talk about um, the voyage of the Argo briefly. 
the Gemini archetype. Then we're going to talk about um, Gemini man and then finish with face off. So, uh, so double impact, basically um, there's a ceremony opening a tunnel and there are two guys. There's a, obviously a national Chinese businessman and there's a, an English uh, expat, you know, living in Hong Kong businessman. They, they, they cut the, the ribbon, they open up the tunnel. They, you know, it's a tunnel to connect mainland China with Hong Kong. So they don't have to take the boats and, you know, it's big time business, all this stuff. So then they get in their cars and they're going home and the English guys with his wife and he's got his two kids. And we see that Jeffrey Lewis who is, uh, you know, you see him in a lot of Clint Eastwood movies. He's a, he's his BFF or whatever. He's the bodyguard, and he's driving some kind of MG, and he's like, all right, I'm going to follow you home. And, and he's like, no need to follow me home tonight. It looks all right. You know, we just had the big ceremony. Nobody wants to kill me, especially the triads. So, of course, they do. They follow him home, and like an idiot, he, he knows they're following him, and he goes straight home, which is weird, and, like, they're in the driveway waiting for him, and he just pulls up, which is very strange. Um, but... At least he goes out um, like a boss. He pulls a, you know, like a nine from his his uh, his, his glove compartment, and um, they're like, uh, you, "You must die!" And he starts shooting them, and he takes out a bunch of them on his way down. But you know, he gets smoked, and then uh, you know, big boss man or whatever comes over and smokes the wife. And uh, let's see, then Jeffrey Lewis. Well, he got a call last minute, and he's like, you, you know, we're, we're going, they're following me. So he's like, all right. So then he goes, and he, Jeffrey Lewis shows up, and he's got like a, a you know, 357 or something in his glove compartment, and he shoots like 35 rounds without reloading, which is interesting. He takes out a bunch of them. Um, the bad English uh, businessman is just down the hill with the bad Chinese uh you know, gangster, and they're listening to what happens. So Jeffrey Lewis, like, takes one of the babies, and he escapes, and he sees them down there, and he's like, D Williams? And then he, you know, and he escapes. So he's he's basically, he's identified the bad guy. And then the uh, nurse maid takes the other twin, and then she escapes to the city, I guess, to, a, a, you know, a, a nunnery. Leaves the baby right there in the front. I don't know why she didn't just go walk all the way in. Or just take the baby herself, which is weird. Uh, but she drops the baby off there. So now we know that the twins um, are going to grow up in uh, different worlds. One of them is going to grow up, uh, you know, in an orphanage, which looks all right in Hong Kong. Um, and the other one's going to grow up with uh, Jeffrey Lewis wherever he goes. So he makes his way, of course, to uh, Los Angeles. And uh, next thing we see, cut, you know, it's 24 years later. And uh, we see that he's running some kind of like aerobics dance karate dojo. And uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme has vaporwave um, aqua purple blue uh, aerobics tights on, and he's doing the complete splits in front of eight women who are, like, d d frothing over him. And uh, he's, he seems very innocent and naive, but still, you know, suggestive. And he's like, look what I can do. You know, I can do the total split. I'm the total package. And they're like... You know, and they're like, yeah. And then Jeffrey Lewis walks in and he's like, oh, what's going on here? This is not my regular dojo. And then this, and then this like, uh, you know, obligatory um, English ponytailed uh, too short, like douchebag shows up and he's like, you think you can do karate? Well, you think you can do the splits? I bet you, can, I bet you can't hit me. Go on and give you a shot. Bam. And he gets kicked in the face right away. A lot of kicks in this movie. A lot, way more kicks than punches. Um, which is, well, I, you know, the kicks, I, I don't know how you guys feel about the kicks. It's kind of like why I like Seagal movies because um, Seagal does a lot of, you know, sort of turning their attempts at kicking back on him. I don't, I'm not a big fan of the kicks. I think the kicks are uh, kind of fake and gray, right? Unless it's kicking in a door or, you know, a, a power kick or like a Mortal Kombat, you know, round, roundhouse kick that's, you know, Swayze or something. The kicks are kind of weird, right? Why, why not just like, I don't know. It's very, it's very weird to me. Maybe that's just my thing. But anyway, he kicks him in the face. Of course he gets knocked out. Um, so we know this guy means business, even though this Jean-Claude Van Damme twin is, you know, uh, very wholesome. So then we learn uh, through Jeffrey Lewis that um, they've identified the, the bad guys and they found uh, the other twin. It's been 24 years, right? There's no, there's no, there's no um, Facebook, Google. Uh, they got to go the hard way and I guess 
write pen pal letters or something. I don't know what they do, even though he's high up as a, um, you know, secret service intelligence karate bodyguard, which is weird. It seems like he would keep tabs on the other twin. But anyway, so he's like, we're going, we're going to HK baby. And he's like, well, why are we going to Hong Kong? We're good here in LA. I've got this aerobic studio, but they go to Hong Kong and they walk into this bar, and then it turns out um, that this hot lady walks up to Jean-Claude, and she's, you know, she's like, hi, and she gives him a big old snog. Somebody else walks up, hands him a, a bunch of cash. He's like, wow, Hong Kong is great. He's very good here. You just walk into the bar, they give you cash. What's the deal? And then we see the bad brother, and he's in... Um, Leather jacket, all black, slick slick back hair, and he walks in seeing him uh, make out with his girl. So, of course, he punches him in the face, and he calls him an F-slur, which is, there are a lot of those in this movie. <laughs> it's it's one of those movies where this is, you know, pre, um, there, there's a light sort of skin and max uh, nerdity. There's F-slurs. A lot of them drop. There's a lot of stuff that they could do and say, you know, pre- um, Pretty whatever, right? So, um, yeah, so, as well, a Sam Hyde kick. A Sam Hyde kick would put you through a, I'm going to put you through a motherfucking wall. <laughs> Peanut Arbuckle's kick will put you through a wall for sure. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of F slurs amongst the two brothers, mainly aimed at one brother who uh, looks very, you know, the, the good uh, Jean-Claude twin is, um, very straight laced preppy, which is strange because he did grow up with Jeffrey Lewis, like, and he does this aerobics. To, I don't know, whatever. So, um, we're going to talk about that with the archetypes and why later and why they're like that. But anyway, so let me try and make this a little more concise. So, um, we see that the brother in Hong Kong that grew up in an orphanage and on the streets is now into crime. He's a black marketeer, he runs. Uh, stolen cars, I guess, Mer like we uh, Mercedes that they, they can't get uh, in the mainland. Um, cigarettes, we see lots of uh, cigarettes and I guess other stuff. But anyway, he, he's like, come along, we do this deal. I just uh, seen you and, you know, you look exactly like me, even though I won't uh, uh, acknowledge that you look exactly like me and talk like me. I won't acknowledge that for a long time. You are not my brother. This is not my brother. He is a, he's a, he says that like a hundred times, but he's like, come along on this deal. We're going to do worth a lot of money. So they go to the docks, they get on a boat, they do a, a whole switcheroo. And immediately the, the cops in the Harbor do their, boo, boo, whoop. I can't do it. How do they do it? We, we, whoop. it sounds very weird. It's very, it's very tame. And, and like, it's a, it's a boat, it's a uh, Hong Kong boat cop. So they're like, we, we, and they have to translate, they have to yell at him through the megaphone in two languages. Really three, I guess. They probably do Mandarin, Cantonese, and English, which gives them time to be like, did you set this up? No, you set it up. Then they, they fight with the guy they're doing the deal with. He pushes him off the boat. Then they, you know, press on the on the gas on the boat, and they get away very easily. Um, then later they confront one of the guys who plays like, you know, uh, Big Boss Chang or whatever. He's one, He's one of the bad guys. He's a triad, you know, bad guy. Um, the good Jean-Claude confronts him. He gets beaten up by Liu Kang, who is the henchman of the guy. He's the guy that's in all the Jean-Claude movies. <laughs> he's the guy who flexes and has, like, the scar on his face. And, you know, he's Liu Kang, right? Easily uh, whoops his ass, throws him into a shipping container. They don't kill him for some reason, which is very weird. <laughs> um because he screwed up their deal. He won't work with them. He won't take their deal. And it seems like he's, you know, some kind of informant. So it's very weird. They just leave him there. Um, uh, anyway, then um, somehow they escape. They get on the boat and they escape to, you know, I don't know. Uh, big, big uh, n not um, St. James Island, right? They escape to the good, the good one where nobody is. And it's all dilapidated. And it's just these three fellas. And they're going to, you know, fix up this whole shack and they're going to live there. And Jeffrey Lewis says, um, I've seen worse, you know, because he was probably in Nam, He's probably Phoenix, right? He's seen worse. He lived in, you know, Saddam's palace. So they, they live there and I guess they're trying to get along or whatever. They don't really need to train very much. And they're thinking about how they're going to get back at these triads and this, this other guy that planned the whole thing. In the meantime, they got this uh, hot blonde um, 
expat woman who's on the inside and she like comes and tells them, you know, the deal and what they're saying and stuff. And uh, she's in love with the, I guess the bad Jean-Claude, but somehow like she escapes with the good one. Oh, because the good one, he goes back to the mainland and he gives them a, a, a carton of cognac and he says, hey, this is for uh, the big boss. I'm, I'm nobody. You don't know me, but take this giant crate. So they take the crate. Of course, it's filled with, you know, dynamite. He comes in with another one. The big boss wants to meet you. All the bad guys in this are Belgian, which is, you know, interesting. And uh, then it explodes. They escape. They bring the blonde girl back. Then the, the two brothers fight. Um, they don't want to see each other. They want to kill each other. But right then at that moment after they fight, then the bad guys invade with, a, um, you know, Go Golden Eyes got an army. And they come, you know, with all sorts of automatic weapons on this island. They're going to take it over. But... Um, the good guys, I guess they get away, and then eventually what happens is they get back to the mainland. There's a big sh uh, shipyard. One brother goes after one guy. The other one goes after the other guy. One guy um, one guy uh, goes after, you know, Big Bad Chang or whatever and puts his arm in a, you know, in a gear thing. He's got his cane. He's running with his cane. Oh, he pulls out his cane. He's got a sword cane, and so he has a little sword fight. Jean-Claude gets all cut up. Ah! Ah! Kicks him in the face a bunch of times. Then he gets thrown in the thing. Then he gets, I don't know, he gets, he, he gets killed. Then the good Jean-Claude, uh, he's chasing the, the you know, sleazy uh, Anglo guy who is, you know, a secret gangster or whatever, working with these other guys. And uh, I can make a deal. Why is he speaking French? I can make a deal with you. I can make a deal with you. But he's not Cockney, so it's... um. I can make a deal, even though you're scum. I can make a deal. I own all of the shipping and the tunnels. I could have you. I could have you killed right now. Why didn't he have an army? It's very strange. But anyway, so he gets a shipping container dropped on his head, and he gets squashed, which is fitting. Um, and then uh, that's pretty much the end. You know, the two brothers are brothers. They unite, and all is well. Um, also, Jeffrey Lewis, who who got tortured in. Uh, Han Solo's basically he got tortured in the same exact place where Han Solo was frozen in carbonite same exact place um, so he's also okay and then the girl's okay oh and there's one scene where the the blonde girl gets uh, weirdly searched and then almost uh, a, a, a slalted, assaulted by the bad um, the bad hench girl hench woman who in real life was that um she was a bodybuilder woman, and she's like, now I need to search the front. And you're like, oh, what? And it's very, very uncomfortable. Um, anyway, then the blonde girl, she's kind of like, oh, and she just kind of sidesteps out of it, which is you know, very easy. But uh, they're on camera, and the, the henchmen are watching this. It's very, very strange um, detail. But I guess it just goes to show that there are two sides in this. There's the, there's the underworld. And then there's the overworld. There's the legit overworld where one of the brothers has, you know, grown up. And that is to represent sort of sort of a mid-ground where he came from. Because obviously he came from a more elite. They both came from this more elite family. You know, the guy's obviously like the governor of Hong Kong or, you know, he's a businessman authorizing this, this tunnel. And he's in charge of all the shipping. So he's, you know, in the, he's up in the system. Um, the other one, of course, gets thrown into the orphanage and grows up in the underworld. He deals with all of the bad guys. So there's this weird dichotomy, and that, of course, is the very um, a trope or archetype that we get in Edith Hamilton's mythology. This is what she explains. Um, this is the kind of... I think this is the go-to book for mythology. And, you know, I'm sure there are more... Um, Obviously, there are more advanced and detailed uh, examples of this. You know, you could get, I don't know, the Golden Bow, right? We could use J.G. Frazier. A number of different classic things, but this is my go-to ever since I was in seventh grade, and it still holds. That's why it's a classic. So, so um, Edith Hamilton, who synthesizes all of this from various sources, which she, she cites. I mean, she talks about the Homeric sources, um, Virgil, all right, in the Aeneid, uh, who else? Of course, uh, Apollonius. Um, she, at some point, she talks about the two that we've uh, talked about, Suetonius and um, uh, 
who's the other one? Uh, Tacitus, various classical sources, but she kind of makes it easy and synthesizes it. And she says um, that, let's see, when she's talking about the Gemini, she's talking about the lesser gods of the earth. And she says, besides these gods of the earth, there was a very famous and very uh, popular pair of brothers, Castor and Pollux, who's also known as Polydeuces, who in most of the accounts were said to live half of their time on earth and half in heaven. So there are different accounts of this. And of course, the, the astrological you know, stuff about Gemini is going to differ slightly, but that's because it has an astrological edge, right? Um, and it's talking about... Uh, fortune and all this stuff. And actually, um, look, there's a kind of Gemini, right? Remember we did that? We did that, Dorian Gray. Of course, that's me and Jake Gyllenhaal, so that doesn't count. Um, the original one had the humanoid. Here's Castor and Pollux. That really is kind of the best example that I could get. To show. The All the other ones are either too small or they're blurry or they're, not in the right form. They're just not really great examples, which is interesting. Um, but, of course, there's Castor and Pollux, and Nick Cage plays Castor, and uh, what's the guy's name? Nivola. This guy, Nivola, who went on to be kind of a movie heartthrob for the ladies. He's in various other things. I can't really name him, but he plays a, a true, you know, kind of Gil Bates nerd here. He's Pollux. And then we got the bad guy. Remember this bad guy in the back with the, the scar face? He's in, what's he's in The Saint. He's in, I think he's in Braveheart. He's in like a ton of stuff, that guy. He's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, there's Castor and Pollux. And so the question is the archetype of these Gemini, these twins, right? Because the Gemini are, they're twins and they, they show up as sort of mirror images and so, you know, Double Impact is about that. We get these two, these two guys who are so different. They look and sound exactly like they're identical twins. Of course, Castor and Pollux, it's not specified in Edith Hamilton whether they are identical or not. They can be fraternal. In uh, Face Off, they're, you know, obviously fraternal twins. But they are twins. Now, the question becomes in... In literature and film, you know, oftentimes we have examples of this that are figurative, right? We'll get a pair of people who are kind of two sides of a dualistic coin, and they are, you know, they are symbolically figure, um, uh, Gemini, or they're, you know, they, we can see them as kind of twins, yin and yang. And she even talks about how the Gemini, they can be seen as, exact opposites but they have a, a kernel of something significant inside them or a value or a an action something that the other lacks and that they make up for so for example she talks about how um let's see she says but the accounts of them are contradictory sometimes pollux alone is held to be divine and castor immortal who want a kind of half and half immortality merely because of his brother's love um, they are the sons of Leda. I didn't realize. I for, totally forgot about this. Leda, as in Leda and the Swan. Leda and the Swan is a Yeats poem. Remember that Leda was uh, was uh, R worded by a Swan who was Zeus in disguise. And we've actually talked about this in relation to when people have divine visions and the difference between angels appearing right and demons or these you know these pagan gods. Right. They always come in the guise of something else and do they do these horrible things as a test, right? Ver versus the angels, who just simply, you know, just in the simplest terms, appear and say who they are and that they they're there for God. Right? It's always in the guise of like some animal who they're going to do some terrible thing and then later they're going to tell you, oh yeah, you passed the test. Now you can be immortal as a tree. I know I'm being glib, but, you know, it is interesting. Um, so it says, uh, Leda was the wife of King, uh, King Tyndarius of Sparta. And the usual story is that she bore two mortal children to him, Castor and Clytemnestra, Agamemnon's wife. And to Zeus, who visited her in the form of a swan, two others were immortal, Pollux and Helen, the heroine of Troy. Nevertheless, both brothers, Castor and Pollux, were often called sons of Zeus. Instead, 
uh, the Greek names they're best known by, the, uh, what's this, the Dioscori means the striplings of Zeus. On the other hand, they were also called the sons of Tyndarius, then the Tyndaridae. They're always represented as living just before the Trojan War, at the same time as Theseus and Jason and Atalanta. They took part in the Caledonian boar hunt. They went on the quest of the Golden Fleece, and they rescued Helen when Theseus carried her off. But in all the stories, they play an unimportant part, except in the account of Castor's death when Pollux proved his brotherly devotion. The two went, we are not told why, to the land of some cattle owners, Idas and uh, Lincius. There, Pindar says Idas made angry in some way about his oxen, stabbed and killed Castor. Other writers say the cause of the dispute was the two daughters of the king of the country, uh, Lysipius. Pollux stabbed uh, Lincius, and Zeus struck Idas with his thunderbolt, but Castor was dead, and Pollux was inconsolable. This is page 41 of Edith Hamilton's mythology. He, in the section, The Lesser Gods of the Earth, he prayed to die also, and Zeus, in pity, allowed him to share his life with his brother to live half of thy time beneath the earth and half within the golden homes of heaven. According to this version, the two were never separated again. One day they dwelt in Hades, the next in Olympus, always together. So that's one version. That is one version of Castor and Pollux. Um, and we see that uh, literally in, well, many examples in literature and film, right, where the two brothers are inseparable. Um, and when they are separated, they sort of wreak havoc. And so the, like, the best example of that for tonight would obviously be Face Off, right? Because Nick Cage and Nivola, Castor and Pollux, are these twin, you know, they're, they're twin brothers, we're told. Um, that's part of the plot. And they are uh, international terrorists. Of course, Nick Cage has all of the charisma, and he's like the, the outside guy, whereas... The other dude is the, you know, he's the, the Gil Bates, uh, you know, te tech guy, right? I've designed the best, the best uh, bomb for the, the L.A. Convention Center. Everyone's going to love it. I, I'm Michelangelo. Right. Totally weird. Um, they're both, you know, sociopathic or whatever. But it makes for a good movie. And the interesting thing with that, of course, is that um, we have twins in face off. I'm kind of, I'm going to kind of transition into uh, face off analysis here. Um, we have twins in face off, but the Castor and Pollux thing then goes into further twins, right? Because Travolta and cage are two sides of a personality. They're, ex they're, they're exact opposites. So in a way they are Gemini. And then when they switch, they become each other. So it's like they walk through a weird looking glass and their personae literally change. So then we have to figure out which one is the twin of Pollux. And they kind of both become that. They both fit into their new roles uh, fairly easily, which, which is interesting. It's an interesting concept for a film because, um, of course, okay, so, you know, I think everybody here knows this, but what happens in Face Off is, um, getting it later on into it that we have a a crime detective guy. He's the head of you know the unit. Just do your damn job, sir. How do you run this unit, right? And then we have Nick Cage, who is the you know uh, charismatic uh, international terrorist guy who's on all the watch lists or whatever, and he loves doing crime and going out into the open. And he also at the beginning of the film snipes. He kills the son of John Travolta, his arch enemy. Um, and it's, it's shown to be sort of a semi accident. He takes the shot anyway, but he, it's weird how he kind of tries to redeem himself. So we see that he is still a person uh, later on because what happens is they swap faces so that Travolta can infiltrate the crime unit and find out where the bomb is and go to prison. Right. And talk to his brother Pollux. Totally ridiculous, but what's interesting is that this is so far ahead of deep fakes and face swapping and all that 
And it's also human experimentation that they willingly go into at the Walsh, at the Brandon Walsh Institute in L.A. And, right, of course, like three people know about it and they get, you know, they get smoked right away. And then um, so it's like uh, the departed, um, you know, in extremists. Right. You're so undercover that you lose not only your personality and your, your cover, but you can't go back and nobody knows about it and nobody's going to believe you. Right. Um, one thing that this movie, before I really dive into it, one thing that this movie really, uh, I found a small reference to this, it kind of predicts is they're waiting on this building to explode, right? Because of a bomb. It's got, you know, all these people in it. It's a convention center. Of course, it's LA, not uh, in NY. Um, it's not a uh, WTC. But one thing that they they discuss is that Oh, there's no interagency cooperation, right? Everybody's just trying to look out for each other. So nobody, we're so secret, nobody will say anything, Travolta says. And this is what, um, so this is 90, I think this is 90, 97 or 98, right? So it's just a few years before Big Nine. It shows you how kind of whimsical, right, everything was prior to that. It's so it's so light. This is like the extent of the horrible crime depicted uh, in film. It's it's so light and it's so you know oh it's so unbelievable, and it's it's just strange looking back. Um, the the gigantic shift in in people's you know mentality, especially expressed you know in in movies. Um, they tried to do stuff like this again afterwards, but it. It didn't work because people were so people were um, publicly traumatized and, and jaded by Big Nine. They couldn't, you know, it was either ridiculous, stupid comedies that they rolled out just to, you know, distract people, right? Or like movies about Big Nine in the Middle East. That's that's what we got, right? Um. Anyway, so so it's just it's just interesting looking back on this uh, i remember when it came out i went with my friends we thought it was so cool because nick cage was so cool like he you know he did this he sets the bomb or whatever and you know he does his thing that he doesn't like handles which is i thought was i didn't like that part and he like gropes the choir girl um but he does that face and he does the dancing and he he, he um he's funny and he's charismatic and then he gets to the airfield and like the guy gives him his box and his box has like chiclets and you know, he, the, it's got the blue pill, by the way, did you notice that he takes the blue pill? Um, and you know, he's got his, uh, uh devil's lettuce, uh, cigarillos in there basically. And his gun his golden guns, right? He's got his golden guns and he gets chased by Travolta flying a chopper, um, they try and keep the the plane down. He's going to shoot the pilot. He does do that. He th the girl, by the way, the woman on the plane, um, who is like, oh, any, do you need anything before we take off, um, sir? And he's like, yeah, I need you to suck my tongue or whatever Nick Cage says. It's so obviously a plant. It's like, um, I thought that wasn't very good in terms of, is that just so that the audience will know that she's a, you know, she's an informant that they put her there. It was very unbelievable. She was not nearly um, skeezy enough. <laughs> she looks like she literally just came from the Fed office and they put her there. And Nick Cage is like, all right. Yeah. Anyway, so he shoots her and throws her out the plane. Um, and then they, you know, they drive right into the hangar. And that's when the guy, we see the guy on the wires get thrown back 30 feet because it's angly, I guess. Um, but another interesting thing is, um, when he gets sent to prison, um, he goes to this, uh, weird future prison where they have magnetic floors and they're wearing basically ski boots that keep all the prisoners like locked down on the floor. So if anything bad happens, they can just, you know, hit the button and then they, they all have to freeze. Well, the problem is that, um, you know, uh, people in, uh, crime are very good at getting around whatever the system is. So they fight and then they realize the guards are going to let them fight. And then they use their giant magnetic ski boots to, you know, like kick each other to death. And plus Mr. Jangles likes to see the fights and he loves wielding that, you know, electric baton. I'm the one who decides when the fights are over here. I'm Mr. Jingles. 
And so eventually when Nick Cage gets thrown into the prison um, and sees Thomas Jane, by the way. <laughs> Dude, what happened to Thomas Jane? Right? I thought Thomas Jane was pretty cool. He was good in that shark movie. Um, you know, he was in The Punisher. They put him in that weird HBO movie where he played a, 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 a gigolo, which actually didn't make him look bad. I mean, he just played an idiot. But, you know, he was, he, I thought he could have been cool. You know, I think probably the, the, truly the reason why he never, you know, really hit it was because of his name, obviously. Right? I mean, you can't be, you know, it's Christian Bale. Um, you know, Leo, who else? Uh, even Daniel Day Lewis, right? Which is a, you know, a, po a posh name. Um, the, the rock, <laughs> right? I mean, Mark Wahlberg, but like that's, he was already famous. So he was Marky Mark, but Thomas Jane, I mean, uh, I don't know, dude. Right. I, I think that's actually why, uh, people just never took to him, but he's pretty, you know, I thought he was pretty cool. And he, he plays, a. You know, just kind of a guy that um, that Castor knew in the old days in this, and he helps with the prison escape, right? I like it when actors have their their actual name. Um, Emilio Estevez, it's pretty cool. Charles Sheen, that's not his real name. Charles Estevez, that's his name. Chuck Norris is Carlos Ray. Michael Keaton is Michael Douglas. There was already a Michael Douglas. Um, Kirk Douglas, that's not his name. Right. Where was Kirk Douglas from? Um, he was like Estonian or Polish or something. You know, he was a circus guy. Uh, Tom Coombe is actually Thomas Coombe uh, Maypother, of course. Good he changed it to Tom Coombe. That's a cool name. Um, so, so what we see is that we've got Castor and Pollux in Face Off, and they are both, they're fraternal twins, but they're both in the underworld. So then the focus becomes, um, what's John Travolta's name? Uh, Archer. His name is Archer in this, so it's another astrological name. He's like a Sagittarius. And they are kind of two sides of a year, right? We've got Sagittarius and then Gemini. And they're chasing each other, I guess, through the heavens or whatever. Um, but they become opposites of each other. They're opposing each other. And one is from the overworld. One is from the underworld. And then they switch sides. Um, and they're obviously, you know, they're obviously supposed to be dualistic opposites in this in how they're, they're set up. Um, and... Let's see, this book says, uh, let's see, the, okay, it says, uh, according to, uh, according to this version, the two were never separated. Again, uh, one dwelt in Hades, yeah, the, the other in Olympus, always together. The late Greek writer Lucian gives another version, um, which is, in which their dwelling places are heaven and earth, and when Pollux goes to one, Castor goes to the other so that they will never, they're never with each other. In Lucian's little satire, Apollo asks Hermes, I say, why do we never see Castor and Pollux at the same time? Well, Hermes replies, so it's hermetic. They are so fond of each other that when fate decreed one of them must die and only one be immortal, they decided to share immortality between them. Not very wise, Hermes. What, um, I read all over this book, so I can't see because my notes. What proper employment can they engage in that way i foretell the future uh escalapius cures diseases you are a good messenger but these two are they to idle away their whole time no surely ah they're in poseidon's service their business is to have any is to save any ship in distress ah uh, now you say something i'm delighted they're in such a good business two stars were supposed to be theirs the gemini the twins they were always represented as riding splendid Snow White horses, but Homer distinguishes Castor above Pollux for horsemanship. He calls the two Castor, tamer of horses, and Polydeuces, good as a boxer. So, so Pollux is the boxer, which is interesting because in, in Face Off, it's the opposite. Um, 
right? Caster is a, is a fist fighter. And that's interesting because one of the things that the common motif between these three movies is a nautical one. And I thought that was, that may have actually even been accidental, but you notice that, first of all, how is Caster uh, killed at the end of the movie? It's in Archer's body, so it's in John Travolta's body, but it's with a harpoon, and they're by the bay. They're by the sea. Uh, there's a big fight, like, on boats. Um, in, um, let's see, Gemini Man, which we're going to get to, uh, the main Will Smith is he's a Marine and he's always on the water. He's always in his boat. He escapes in his boat. Um, and in, um, and in a uh, double impact, right? They're constantly on boats. They're on Victoria Harbor. They're split by the water. They got to go from Kowloon to Hong Kong. They, they're involved in shipping. So it's this constant water theme, which is interesting. Um, there's also obviously boxing. There's fighting in all three of these. And the brothers are even fight each other continuously. Uh, this says, um, let's see what it says. Okay, yeah, that's it for them. Uh, also, that that Pollux is called Polydeuces is interesting because even his name literally means men, like many of two. So there's two, and then two, and then, and they they keep going into these. Um, twin these this twin motif so it's like we have these original twins who are split between each other and then they turn into the way they affect people is to have further twins so in face off we have we have nick cage and john travolta who are like two side they're like yin and yang right but they are a variation of the original caster and pollock's brothers in this so when pollock goes to jail in a way like John Travolta takes his place. And it's the same for Travolta. Nick Cage takes his place. They're constantly after, they're, cir they're circling one another. I'm trying to think of a horse theme in this. Uh, I guess in Double Impact, it would be like the kicks, the constant kicks, maybe. That's kind of stretching it. Um, what else? What else is equestrian in these? Uh, not really much. Okay, well, regardless of that, um, there's still the nautical theme. Uh, let's see what else does it say. We need to go back to Alita and the Swan in a second. Um, this was also interesting because right before this, when it's talking about the lesser gods of the earth, pages are coming out. When it's talking about the lesser gods, it begins by talking about Pan, and please like and share the stream, you guys. Uh, thank you again for bearing with me here through all the tech. And I thought this would be kind of a, I know this is kind of turning cerebral with uh, Edith Hamilton, but I thought it would be a fun stream talking about Jean-Claude Van Damme. If you want to see more Jean-Claude Van Damme, if you want to see Lionheart, uh, Kickboxer, um, what, what else? A Hard Target, Universal Soldier. If you want to see any J, uh, JCVD, um, please uh, you can super chat, you can sponsor a stream, or you can just drop a comment after the stream is over in the comments. You can write me an email, madmaximalism at gmail.com with two X's, madmaximalism, two X's. Um, you can also support via Cash App, PayPal, super chat, so you can drop a super chat right there, and I'll read your comment. Um, that helps me out a lot. You can drop me a dono chat there. Jason's dropping all the links. Jethro, thank you to y'all, too. Appreciate y'all so much. Jethro Kang, appreciate you for uh, letting everybody know that I was running late with the Boomer Tech. Um, so back to Pan. Um, it's interesting that it brought up Pan because Synchro, I've seen references to Pam like Pan, not Pam, not Jim Morrison's girl, Pam. All the poems have wolves in them. All but one. She dances in a ring of fire and throws off the challenge with a shrug, he says to Pam. Um, no, Pan. Uh... That's awesome. What else is that in? That's in Step Brothers. Is your name Pam or Pan? Pa Pam, Pan, Pan? <laughs> Nerd the job interview. So Pan is referenced in a whole bunch of random and disparate stuff this week that I saw. That's the way it is when you when you read, obviously, because you start to see all these unusual words and terms and then notice them. But I'll be doing a, a big analysis on Jamie's channel with Jamie Henshaw. Shouts out to Jamie. Uh, we're, I think we're doing it this coming Friday. We're going to talk about 
the Pan archetype and Peter Pan. We're going to go into a deep, deep dive into Peter Pan, the uh, Jay and Barry book, the story, uh, Disney, Pan archetype. Um, what else? Uh, anything with goats and Pan and Baphomet and uh, Crowley, the movie Horns, uh, Pan's Labyrinth, um, a million things. And if you have any pan references that you've seen in literature or film, can you please drop those somewhere in the comments uh, after the stream is over? Cause I would appreciate that. I need, uh, I, I have like a million, but I'm sure there's something I'm forgetting. For instance, I saw a clip from dragnet. Remember the 1987 movie dragnet with uh Hom tanks and uh, Dan, Dan Aykroyd, Tom Hanks and, and Dan Aykroyd and Christopher Plummer in a great role, by the way. Um, Christopher Plummer plays a like a a priest in and he goes to LA to stop the decadence and the dis, d, disgusting depravity of 1980s Los Angeles and it turns out up oh, he's the head of a pagan goat cult right dressed as Baphomet throwing the sacrificing a young uh, woman in white to a snake you remember that movie it it's obviously it's a comedy but it is it's funny cuz it's revelatory and it has all the imagery so that has goats, of course. Um, what else? Black Phillip in The Vitch. The Vitch that came out in like 2015. Wouldst thou like to live fergaliciously? The taste of butter will remove thy shift, he says. That's a great movie. Um, we've discussed before, but that's a very well done movie. Uh, Black Phillip. Jingle, jingle, he appears behind her. That same jingle sound appearing in Hereditary made it around the same time. What else? Um, let's see. Jason says, Shutter Island when Leo gets headache and one scene in Dr. Otto Lang as well. It slows a pan statue playing. Oh, really? I didn't I didn't realize that. Nice catch, Jason. Appreciate that. A pan patchy, uh, statue playing pipes, the pan pipes. Uh, pandemonium, the word panic, of course, the word panic, um, etymology comes from pan, uh, and the Bacchic rites. Um, I got to reread the Bacchae this week, Euripides, the Bacchae. Oh, uh, also I'll be talking about, it's not a spoiler and who can, you know, it's, it's, this is pretty deep, deep, deep cut stuff. I'll be uh, discussing Sylvia Plath's, um, diaries. I've mentioned this before one time, and it was during a Sylvia Plath analysis that we did way a while, a long time ago, one of our first streams. Um, but in her diaries, this I remember this so vividly. She uh, discusses how she and Ted Hughes were got into the occult, and he was, you know, uh, very. In you can read his book uh, Shakespeare and the Goddess of Complete Being. It's his esoteric analysis of Shakespeare, and we've discussed Ted Hughes before in depth, but. Um, they were obsessed with this Ouija board and they contacted an entity that called itself pan. And, um, there was an incident in the Lake district where he did something to her and dissociated. So I'll be mentioning that because very scary and uh, deep cut. Even people who know about Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes don't really know that one. So I'll be mentioning that one since we're a, a literary place here. So, yeah, if you've got any uh, pan stuff, you can help me out by putting that in the stream afterwards. That, I would appreciate that. I'll give you a shout-out when we do that Friday. Um, also, check me out on – just a little mid-break mid, mid break here. You can check me out on my two um, guest spots I did on Boiler Room this week. One, or Sorry, on uh, TNT Radio. One was with uh, Jorve on um, – what was that? Thursday? Thursday. Uh, was that Thursday, first hour, 8 o'clock to about nine o'clock on his show. Go to TNT radio and do a search and you'll find me where we discussed all sorts of stuff. Baudelaire literature, um, Shakespeare. We discussed again, the authenticity of Shakespeare. Um, I discussed that in th I think three different places last week. People are really into that topic and that's, that's fine. I'm not going to do my own stream on it because I've um, gone into it so many times. Also, it, it is a topic that, that, um, uh, that, irks me by nature, but I don't mind talking about it when people ask about it because that's fine, you know, and people don't know. Um, but it, yes, IMO Shakespeare was Shakespeare. He was not someone else, um, but I understand the skepticism that people have about that. But anyway, um, I was also on uh, Miss Lynn's show 
uh, without Hesher on Friday. Usually, uh, it's you know it's Hesher show on Friday. State of the Nation. So check me out for that twenty minute spot. Hopefully, I'll be on there again soon. And you can check me out from Boiler Room on their Rockfin channel, Rockfin Boiler Room. Um, this one wasn't on YouTube. Last week's was. Or you can go to ACR Alternate Current Radio. Okay, so that's enough of that. Um, yeah, we've been doing a lot of stuff. And just one more thing for the future. I'm going to be getting into back into heavy, deep, uh, strictly literary streams um, for a little while coming up here. We've been doing a bunch of films, a bunch of movies. Shouts out to my sister there. Bunch of movies um, for a while now. I, I kind of looked at the channel and I went, oh, wow, we've done a bunch of movies. So we've put in our time now with movies. So we're going to be doing just strictly literature for, a, a you know, a minute here. We'll be doing H.G. Wells. Uh, what else? Um, the Decameron, uh, Ben Franklin's writings. Um more Shakespeare, I think some Dickens, more Cormac McCarthy. Uh, let's see. Shouts out to Matty G out there. He sent me a book. We're gonna that was on the uh, it was a National Book Award finalist. Um, so we're gonna do that and bunch of stuff. What's Bill Hicks says? Bill says, "What about sk What about skillets? You talking about skillets or skittles?" Shelby Foot. I started his Civil War series. Yes, Shelby Foot. Um, so who was it? Somebody, maybe it was Eric, wrote me about Shelby Foot a while back. Um, I'm going to try to do a Gone with the Wind uh, stream, not the film. I'll do the novel. It's very different from the film, but that one might be too spicy. Um, but it might, might not even be worth it, but we'll see. Uh, yes, Pan's Labyrinth. We could, do, we could do some C.S. Lewis. We could go back and do some C.S. Lewis. We did Lloyd Alexander a while back. So we could do that. Um, oh, and the other one, the literary stream I'm going to do, which is a li literary uh, sort of uh, belle lettre kind of memoir, uh, investigative uh, kind of pseudo gonzo journalism take, which is the, the book Chaos about uh, Charlie Manson, man. <laughs> Charlie Manson, Phoenix Program, man. Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay knew he was in my circle, man. So we're going to do uh, Chaos. That one is going to be a big, big stream because uh, shouts out to Jethro for recommending that book. 2019. Man, it is, it's such a thick book that at some point I kind of stopped, um, you know, uh, taking, taking my sticky notes. I just kind of kind of stopped because I'm like every page of this, is so insane, um, not insane in a bad way, but it's it's a good book. I've read Helter Skelter twice. I've read uh, the other biography of Chaz Manson. I've read done a lot on um, Charlie Manson, and this one's interesting. There's a lot in there that either I'd forgotten or is brand new. You hear stuff mentioned, you know, over the years. For one, all right. Before I get back, one thing that's in, of interest here is the fact that a while ago, somewhere else, I read that. Either Charlie or somebody else or the two of them together went back to 10050 Cielo Drive uh, after the event took place and before the authorities came. Like they came to check on it um, to make sure of things or to, to, to stage it and rearrange things. And uh, that's one of those details that, you know, you can either kind of throw away or just kind of lodge in your in your mind palace. And it popped up again in this book with names of people that um supposedly or may have done that and it's very interesting it's very it, it it's a weird book because uh like it really does um give me the give me the creepy crawlies a little bit to use their phrase but it gives me the creeps um at certain parts there are just certain parts where I, it even for me it's like very it's, it's too much it's very creepy um so i'll be doing uh a full analysis of that book and maybe, you know, who knows, maybe we'll even somehow get uh, the author of that book on for a stream someday. He, he's done a lot of them. So maybe he would do that. Um, if you want him to do that, Tom O'Neill, if you want him to be on this channel, even though we're, we're small over here with our little community of people, if you want him to do an interview, uh, drop him a, a tweet or a, a where, wherever he resides online. You know he's online. Wherever he is, let him know. Come to uh, BLA. 
because we could do a good interview. And I, by the way, you know, I wouldn't like, I don't, I, I don't know, but I'm not good at interviews. I would just talk to him about the book and um, I think I've got some good questions for him. So anyway, that's a, I'll just throw that out there. All right. So let's get back to this because one other place that the Gemini uh, are mentioned in classic literature is in Apollonius of Rhodes in the voyage of the Argo. Now I first read this in this copy in 2001 and it's interesting because the Argonauts give their name to the astronauts, the psychonauts, and of course, Argo, the film. And Jason is one of the classical heroes, but did you know that Castor and Pollux uh, are on the Argo with Jason at certain points? Now, this is from book two onward to uh, Colchis. Forgive my pronunciation. And, um, of course, Poseidon is guiding the ship, and it says, and now he came down to the ship, uh, planted himself among the Argonauts, and not even troubling to ask who they were or what they brought them overseas, had the effrontery to say, listen, sailormen, to something you should know. Uh, this is page 73 of this edition. Again, book two, onward to Colchis, and this is the voyage of the Argo. Uh, translated. Um, he says, no foreigner calling here is allowed to continue his journey without putting up his fists to mine. So pick out your best man and match him against me on the spot. Otherwise, you will find to your sorrow that you defy my laws. You will be brought by main force to obey them. <laughs> his high-handed manner roused them to fury, and Polydeuces, who is Pollux, of course, who took his threat as a personal affront, stepped forward at once to champion his friends. Enough, he said, whoever you may be, let us have no more of this parade of violence. You have stated your rules and we accept them. Here I am ready to meet you in my own free will. Interesting, he talks about free will in this text, right? Because free will and fate are often sort of used interchangeably in terms of their language in the classics, especially in... In, especially in the Nordic texts, which we've covered, right, in the Seafarer, the Wanderer, and in Beowulf. Now, that's for a different reason. That's because the the Christian Christianity and paganism are sort of at a nexus point at the time of composition and in, in, their, in their culture, right, in the timeline. But this is different. Um, this is like, it's almost as if they think that they have a free will paradigm within this overall fate, which is it's strange. It's always been strange to me that they do that. I wonder, I would need somebody else um, to explain that to me. DBH, perhaps. Why? Why do they talk about free will within this greater context of that they're subjects of fate? Because they do it a lot. Um, he says, Polydeuces was wearing a light and closely woven cloak, the parting gift of some Lemnian girl. This he now laid aside. The others drew, uh, threw, threw down his dark double mantle with its clasps and then the knotty staff of Mount Olive that he carried. Then they looked around, chose a satisfactory spot nearby, and told their friends to sit down in separate groups on the sands. This is kind of like in Dune. Remember the fight in Dune? I'm still going, right? How's my volume? My volume good. There we go. You can hear me. Okay, good. Um, he says, in build and stature, the two men showed a complete contrast. Amicus made one think of some monstrous offspring of the ogre uh, Typhus or of the earth herself, the kind she used to bear in the old days of her quarrel with Zeus, you Gaia. But Polydeuces was like a star of heaven shining in all its beauty out of the western night. Such was the son of Zeus with the bloom of the first down still on his cheeks and the twinkle still in his eyes, though in strength and spirit he was hardening like a wild beast. There's a lot in this. You know, mythology is great because, <laughs> because it yields um, so much symbolism. Um, and, you know, of course we get uh, Pollux and, you know, resembling the star and the western night, the star of heaven. Because, of course, Castor and Pollux are going to be stars uh, for sailors also. They're stars for sailors, right? Um, 
Orthodox says fatalism says that your end is sealed, but how you get there is up to you. Interesting. I guess I take that as a given, but doesn't that imply that not not to dive too far deep into this, but doesn't that imply that if that's the case, why do they do anything? Why do, why do they ever do anything? They just figure, ah, fuck it. Right? I mean, why? I guess because with it, you know, to to figure out what their fate is, they'll never figure it out if they don't get there. I don't know. I mean, are the, you know, the mortals are the playthings to the gods, right? Uh, we are but playthings to the gods. They 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 kill us for their sport. King Lear. And th if that's the case, they intervene, of course, but it, their intervention defies fate. But how can they defy fate? Well, I guess because they have the three fates. And when they go, when whenever they go and visit the fates, it's to learn their fate. So they don't know their fate. So they have to go through the, the labyrinth in order to, to discover their end, I suppose. And then they just realize that their journey has been faded, but they don't know what it is until they do it. Yes, no fate. No fate. Um, you can see why they you can see why they had this sort of construct, right? You can see why they have this in their world. Um, you know, the, the volcano blows and the earthquake goes off and everyone's living and then all of a sudden everyone's dead. So I guess you, you can see why they sort of had this, but at some point, um, I don't know. It, when, when Christianity came along, they must have, surely they were... <laughs> Surely they were relieved. Thank goodness this is the, this is the truth because all this shit we've been living with. Right? Zeus is just a demon. Right? I mean, okay, sorry. Sorry. Um, but it's interesting that they mentioned the ogre uh, Typhus because um, Typh Typhoeus. Because they're referring to Typhon, right? The the Titan of the of the abyss. There you go. There's your word. The Titan of the abyss, which then, you know, gets recycled, of course, with um, Dante discussing the Inferno, and then with Al Crowley. You know, this this is a gigantic demon of the abyss. Um, but the what's he say? Also, the bloom of first uh, down still in his cheeks and the twinkle in his eyes and the spirit he was hardening like a wild beast. It makes me think of, you know, like a, a, they're always like this, Adonis or, um, you know, Achilles. It's the the flame and the beauty of youth uh, that um, is either, you know, uh, what is it? Um, li li uh, Better to live like a lion for a day than a lamb for a lifetime. Or one day as a lion. That was Zach de la Roca's side band. Okay, I digress. Um, he began by fainting with his arms to see whether they were still supple and not benumbed by all the hard work and rowing he had done. Anarchus did not follow his example, but stood off in silence, eyeing his opponent and all agog as the thought of drawing blood from his breast. And now Amicus um, steward... Lycorius placed between them at the feet of each a pair of rawhide gloves, thoroughly dried and toughened, and the king addressed the other in his domineering st style. We will cast no lots for these, but to avoid recriminations later, I make you a present of whichever pair you fancy. So, behind, so bind them on your hands, and when you have found out, you can tell your friends how good I am at cutting dried oxide and staining a man's cheeks with blood. Polydeuces indulged in no answering taunt, and with a quiet smile and no parlay, he took the pair that laid his feet. Castor and the great Talaeus uh, came up and quickly bound his gauntlets on with a flow of encouraging words. So they're getting ready for Rocky IV, right? Um, 
They stood apart while this was being done, but when all was ready, they put on their heavy fists in front of their faces and went for each other with a, with a will. In a rough sea, a great wave will curl up over a ship, but just as it seems ready to pour in across the bulwarks, the steerman's skill saves her by a hair's, hair's breadth, and away she slips. In much the same way, though the king attacked, always following up and never giving him a moment's rest, Polydeuces had the craft to avoid his rushes and remain unscathed. Like Rocky says, it don't matter... He says, it don't matter how hard it it don't matter how hard you hit. It, it doesn't matter how hard you hit. It matters how hard you can get hit and keep going. It matters how hard you can get hit and keep going. It's about the it's about the hits you can take. That's a terrible Rocky, but that is how he sounds in that one speech. If I could change, you could change. We can all change. Who doesn't like Rocky IV? Dude, Rocky IV rocks, man. Who doesn't like that? Um, so interesting in that movie that in the training montage, the American is the one with, like, the barn and the, you know, running in the snow and, like, lifting an ox yoke and the... Soviet is the one like getting the getting the roids and like you know f- future treadmill and all this stuff isn't that interesting that's a total uh flip that's a complete inversion right <laughs> i mean it's it's clever because it's like oh the american spirit right um you know the frontier spirit the the self made man yeah you're going to make do with what you have that's great and that's rocky But uh, it's very strange that this, the Soviets were the one with the future tech. Must have been weird when that came out, right? And people didn't have any kind of thoughts about that. Um, also, dude, Dolph Lundgren, I mean, come on. Like, like he would destroy Rocky, right? <laughs> Rocky... Um, Rocky, Rocky, the first Rocky, um, if you've seen that interview with Sylvester Stallone, it's interesting because he talks about how Rocky is, uh, a Christian movie. The, I guess the first scene, the opening scene is of the cross and he, you know, he talks about how he basically has to give himself up to the world and, and humble himself in order to, you know, go against the odds and, you know, and that when he wrote it, he was suffering and he wanted to change his life. And, but Rocky four is like. It's such propaganda that it's it's fu- like that it's awesome, right? It's so it's so in your face. Happy birthday, Polly! Remember the robot? <laughs> it's such a, it's such a good movie, but like he's not a good boxer, right? Like when you watch him fight in Rocky IV, he's terrible. He get his ass whooped. <laughs> um, Daniel Day Lewis is great in the boxer. He's a, an actual great boxer. Who else is good in boxing movies? In this digression. Um, Travolta and Nick Cage fight well in Face Off. Uh, they fight well within the framework of like totally ridiculous fighting. One thing that I realized about both of those characters in that movie is that, you know, you can imagine that in a way the director basically just said, like, be yourselves, but be the most extreme version of yourselves. Like, the caricature of you as people imagine you, be that and more. But what I realized was that both of them, especially Nick Cage in that movie, are in a way doing a... Don't get mad at me for this, but in a way, they're they're Jim Carrey, right? They're just being Jim Carrey. And maybe that's because that was, like, a popular thing in the 90s, but their sort of attitude, especially Nick Cage in that movie, his attitude and his, like, body language is is, like, very... Uh, Ace Ventura ask. I'm not saying that he copied him. I'm saying that it, there's a similarity between those two characters, right? The facial expressions, the, the like, the, 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 the bot. Like his body language is like so big, and he does a lot of. Um, uh, the best part of that movie is when Travolta comes back from capturing Nick Cage, and it's before the the face swap. And they're all celebrating in the office and they have like the champagne 
And they're like, yeah, you got him. You got him. And Travolta goes, he goes, you guys are celebrating, but what about all the people we lost we, that we lost today? Linda, Williams, Johnson, Gizizani, Price, Murchison, Smith, Taylor, Jethro, DJ. Like he says 400 names in that list. <laughs> The one he says after he hesitates for a minute, I forget what the name is. It's like Princip Principali, Chizizani. Then he forgets. He remembers his line. Williams, Johnson, Jackson, Washington. We lost Washington. They lost like a million people and they lost like tens of millions of dollars. There's an airplane that's crashed. The airport is shut down. There's no flights. They still haven't found the bomb right at the convention center. Um, so it is, it is bizarre that they're celebrating. I mean, they did get the international tourist, right? Um, but he's like been operating in the open in LA. He just walked right into the place in LA. No disguise. He's just wearing a, a, a priest collar. That's it. Right. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Jesus, Annie Williams. Uh, let's see. Um, basically, they fight. Caster drew first blood. Um, I watched that movie today. Smiting the head of a man who rushed at him with such force that uh, the severed halves fell down on his shoulders right and left. So he severs a man in half just by punching him, which is very Macbethian, right? From the nave to the chops. Uh, Pollux himself dealt with the huge, uh, these two huge giants. Um, and finally, Jason joins the charge. And then it says, picture a great flock of sheep thrown into panic. There's pan. Panic on a winter's day when the gray wolves have fallen on the folds, eluding shepherds and keen-scented dogs alike. There stand the wolves inspecting their assembled prey and wondering which to pounce on first and carry off while all that the sheep can do is to huddle in a mass and trample on each other's backs. Such was the terror of the Argonauts inspired in their presumptuous enemies. Um, and then finally, at the end, after the fight, they stayed there through the night, tended their wounded, and with an offering to the immortal gods, prepared a mighty feast. Nobody fell asleep by the wine bowl and the blazing sacrifice. This is interesting. They crowned their golden heads with bay from the tree on the shore around which they had cast their hawsers, and in harmony with Orpheus' lyre, they sang a song in praise of Polydeuces, uh, Therapnapian son of Zeus. Their music charmed the windless shore which is interesting because that is the same thing that horace describes in his poems crowning himself the king of poets with um uh, with a it's not with olive branch it's with it's not bay leaves what does he cr he, he crowns himself with he cr basically he, he crowns himself king of poets in that um and this is part of the roman ritual but they are crowned, their golden heads are crowned with bay from the tree. And then Orpheus, of course, Orpheus, um, the Orpheus lyre shows up. And the lyre is important because the, the, the very poems that these, the Homeric poem, right, verse, we've talked about this, verse means to turn, so it represents land, it's agriculture, it's turning the crops. Verse is turn, you're turning. Um, the type of poem in Greek that where actually... They go from the, the beginning of the line to the end, and then the next line should be the end, but it goes beginning to end, so it's it's reversed. It's called a booster feeding, so it mimics the actual you know a planning process. But the lyre itself, which became the lute and then the guitar, and gives us the word lyric, the lyre is like the ancient tortoise shell instrument with the tendon across it, and Homer would sing the poem. He would sing... Uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad to the lyre. The poets sang. They sang their poems. And this is something that occurred all over the ancient world, all over all over the world. Um, which is why poems now are supposed to be heard aloud and read on the page, which is why I'm kind of reading uh, excerpts from this aloud. But suffice it to say, what does that have to do with the Gemini? Well, it shows that the Gemini, the original mythological Gemini, Castor and Pollux, are 
one of two things. They're either together all the time so that and the the sort of deal that they have to take right the plea is they're either in heaven together and then in hell together but they're together um or one is in heaven while one's in the underworld and then they switch and we see examples of both of these played out and it becomes a literal and or a figurative thing in later literature and in films this is translated into like sort of psychic terms where we see characters who are twin you know figures of each other and they internalize this so their darkness or their underworld thing is like in terms of their personality or their persona their one face that they have but we also see this literally for example in face off where they literally take one face and put it on the other character that's his persona that's how he's identified whereas internally he still has this underworld spirit with him so Archer, the Sagittarius, I don't know anything about astrology, but the Archer is the Sagittarius guy, right? I guess it is that, you know, I know centaurs are um, archers. I know that poems are, are represented symbolically in Greek poetry by the centaur. But Archer, John Travolta, right, um, is pursuing the Gemini twins, right? And he's in the regular world. The bad guys are in the underworld. That's their business. But then he, they swap faces and he goes to the underworld. Literally, he goes to the prison, which is the prison ship. Um, we don't know it's a ship at that point, but he goes to the prison underground. And they're like, you're never getting out of here. He's like, when I get out of here, I'm going to have you fart if you get out of here. I'm surprised he even said that. Why didn't he just say you're never getting out of here? Sucks for the guards too, though, doesn't it? Right. I guess it's good if they like to go there and just like, you know, baton these dudes or whatever, but it, it must get lame. Anyway, um, yeah, Mr. Jingles loves it. Mr. Jingles, that guy, uh, what's his name? John Carroll Lynch. He should have been in all of these movies. He should have been the guy in the Shawshank Redemption. He should have been in the Green Mile. Instead of that other dude who played the dad of uh, Jodie Foster in Contact. Hey, Dr. Lecter, I'm a scientist. I'm going to um, I'm going to space in my pod. They blew up one of the one of the space pods, but luckily, um, uh, Gary Busey's son he was a tourist. He blew one of them up, but lucky there's another guy, and he he made an exact one. And I'm going to go to space the space pod uh, in that. What a what a stupid movie! <laughs> I played a streetwalker and taxi driver. Jodie Foster, um, Holly Hunter should be in every Jodie Foster movie. Anyway, um, okay, last movie um, before we uh, finish up Face Off is called Gemini Man. Have you guys seen Gemini Man? Again, it came out 2019. This is directed. Who directed this? Um, this is directed. John, I'm, have I been saying Ang Lee the whole time? John Woo. Oh, wow. That's going to sound uh, our, our word. John Woo is the guy who did Face Off. I apologize. John Woo did Face Off. He was the guy at that time. That's what I meant. Ang Lee did Gemini Man. So I just got confused between those two. I didn't get confused between the people. I, I realize they're different people. Um, John, Woo, John Woo did Face Off. Duh. It's a, such a John Woo movie, right? Now, hopefully I'm right about that. Jethro, did John Woo... Do face off. Please tell me he did. Um, Ang Lee did uh, Gemini Man. And Gemini Man is also um, produced by uh, Bruckheimer, which is interesting. Um, this movie came, was a sleeper. Nobody really... Thank you. Oh, my gosh. So Jethro is the authority that I go to. So this movie was a sleeper. Nobody really knew about this at the time. It's one of those movies that came out like with Ad Astra, which is the... Brad Pitt, Tommy Lee Jones movie where he goes to space. Um, he, excuse me, he falls off of a literal uh, tower of Babel that they're building to space. And then he ends up going back on a mission to find his father, Tommy Lee Jones, who he finds out is not really dead and is Colonel Kurtz in space. Um, also, one of my friends has a small role in that movie, Justin Dre. 
so it, yeah, it came out with Ad Astra and like that movie Bright Burn, I think came out around then. And there were a bunch of movies that came out in 2019 that didn't get a lot because of, you know, events that were about to happen and, you know, stuff that had been happening and all that. But I saw all of them and, um, Gemini man is not, it's not bad. I mean, it's good for like talking about this Gemini thing. There's also a movie called Gemini with, um, Zoe Kravitz and some some lady. I watched that movie, but it's not. There's nothing to really talk about with that. Uh, it's just like a, you know, a celeb in Hollywood fakes her death, and there's some. It's whatever. Um, but so Gemini Man is Will Smith, and the the big thing with this movie is that it involves um, face swap and um, deep fake, and it's weird how far this this technology has come because like any you know, anything on Twitter now or even two years ago looks better and more real and believable than 2019 with this movie. Um, for instance, like remember all the Tom Coom uh, memes that came up all the, the, the remember how Jethro did all of the, the um, deep fakes with JD, right. And the Kurt Russell movies and all that, that looks way better and more believable than this movie does because I think they were still into CGI and they didn't really understand the impact of this. I mean, they, they did it. Remember they did it in Star Wars, uh, the Star Wars reboot with Princess Leia. They did it. They've done it in a bunch of things. And, of course, that's one of the things that they're supposedly, you know, striking over now. Are they still in that? Are they still doing that? They're still in the strike. They must be because I saw Emil Hirsch's Instagram the other day, and I was like, dude, somebody needs to write you a script, man. You, this is getting bad. Um, let me go get my other Red Bull real quick. And when I come back, we will do, we will do Gemini, man. Please don't go anywhere. We've got just a little bit to go. And also if you have any questions about face off or any points to make, please bring them up. I got so scattered with this damn tech tonight. Y'all like it, it, I know I was just boomer attacking it, but shit like that. Like I hate being late. And also it, sweating my ass off hoping this thing went well and then i got it working and then the uh then the camera froze again so anyway we got it now so here we go so i'll be back in two seconds For back from intermission, part two. All right, y'all, let's go. Let's go into Gemini Man. Um, let's see, what'd you say? The unbearable weight of massive talent. What are y'all saying? Had Nick Cage deepfake uh himself. Yes, you're right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hicks. Yes, actually it did. That's a really good point. Um, and what'd y'all think of that movie? It's you know, movies like that like are a great concept, obviously. And uh, that sort of makes me think of what being John Malkatraz, which I thought I, so that movie, the Spike Jones film, Malkatraz machine. That movie is a great movie. And in fact, uh, being John Malkovich sort of makes me think of that movie. Um, 
you know, the actor playing himself. I thought that uh, Malkovich deserved, not like an Oscar means anything, but, you know, it means something on some level. And I thought that uh, Malcatraz deserved an Oscar for that movie for one reason, the uh, the dance of despair. What, what's it called in being John Malkovich? The dance of despair and death or something that he does is so good, is so... That to me was like... Uh, you know, a classical performance. I thought that was really well done. Um, think how hard it would be to play yourself in a film, right? Um, unless you are like, uh, I guess unless you're, you know, a Tau Wanka and your whole life is a performance anyway, or you indulge in, you know, uh, your own performance or you're, you know, Audie Murphy or something. Um, I think that would be incredibly difficult. Then again, like, I mean, I don't know what, whatever I, th things like that risk, um, you know, alienating the, the audience, because in a way we don't care. We, I, you know, we don't care who these people are. Right. But the reason that Nick Cage movie works is because I think that it's tongue in cheek. And like the way that we see him is this lore that he's developed about himself. And he's a charismatic guy. Like he has actual charisma. He's a cool, interesting dude. Right. Neo, neo shamanic um, expressionism. I can't do a Nick Cage, but um, I mean, like, wouldn't you love to hang out with that dude? Like, it would be so it would be so radical. I'd love to hang out with him and like, I guess, Charles Sheen and uh, not AJ in the same night. I wouldn't want to hang out with AJ with them. Um, I want to hang out with AJ for most of the time, then uh, Jesse, I'm Jesse Ventura. He'd be like, yo, what's up, man? You want to go to McDee's? And he'd be like, did you know that the Gateway Project and the uh, CIA Pink Matter uh, when I was in Phoenix programming Vietnam? You know, we don't have that down in Baja. <laughs> Will Sasso's impression is so good. Um, it's funny when he's talking to Theo about it because Theo's impression is he knows that he can't do the impression. And I love that. I love, uh, I love that about, about Theo. Um, yeah. Malcatraz. Uh, remember when Mal Malcatraz's funniest role is, um, in, uh, um, uh, his, of mice and men. Oh boy. You know, they talk about actors being brave, right? Brave choices. Um, and, of course, the thing from Tropic Thunder, never go, you know, full, full R word. Well, he, he did in that movie, but it it's weird because it, it he goes so far that it works, right? Um, I haven't covered of Mice and Men. I don't like that book. Um, it's, it's, de it's deceptive. To me, it deceives me as a reader because uh, it seems to me, my take on it is that it's about two drifters, um, one of whom is, a, you know, not in control of his faculties but is used by the other and is, a, you know, a dangerous uh, psychopathic. Um, uh, they, they roam from place to place uh, drifting kind of like Joaquin Phoenix in um, The Master, doing the same types of jobs. But wherever they go, uh, a woman ends up dead. And if it's not a woman, it's an animal in its place. And, of course, um, you know, Lenny doesn't know that, right? He doesn't have control of that. But it's like, okay, is this Otis? Like, did Otis Tool and, uh, you know, and, um, oh, fuck, what's his name? What's his name, Jeff? Otis Tool and uh, what is it? what's his fucking name, dude? George W. Bush. You know that uh, he's a good he's a good fella. He's a good man. He's a Otis Tool and Otis Tool and he's a good he's a good fella. We're gonna let him go. We're gonna let him go back to the Everglades. What, dude? What's his name? Oh my God, y'all! What is his name? Otis Tool and his partner, that George W. Bush. I am totally um, retardo. I cannot remember. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Henry Lee Lucas. That Henry Lee Lucas is a good boy. We're, we're, we're going to let him go. <laughs> we're 
we're going to commute his sentence. Henry Lee Lucas, right? Who they said was haystacking, but took them to the sites of like 500 different places with receipts. Hand of death cult in uh, Florida Everglades. Very weird. Very strange. Strange events. Okay, let's go to um, uh, what are we talking about here? Uh, let me finish off face off by saying one thing that's interesting is how we gain sympathy for the villain in this. And that's, of course, it's an interesting twist because he, he, they, they call him a sociopath, but I, I guess he's a, not like there's a need for a distinction, but I guess Nick Cage's character is a psychopath because um, he realizes uh, how he needs to use uh, how people like him and how they associate with him. Right. And the best example is how he imitates um, the life of John Travolta's character. And it's not through research because Travolta's character, Archer has done all this research into Nick Cage's character. And we see that over and over in the film. Like for instance, when he goes to the prison and they say, um, and his brother says, yes, what, what medication am I on? And he's like, you know, I give it to you every day. It's, uh, uh, lore tabs. Yeah. Lore tabs. Right. And it's like, okay. Cause he's recalling a file, but, um, the Nick Cage character who becomes John Travolta, he doesn't do the same like thing. He's, he's obviously, he's only learned through experience with this guy that's been following, you know, hunting him. So like he, you know, he's in the GMC and he's like driving down the road and you know, this nice suburbia and he sees his, uh, his wife come out the front door and he drives right past and he's like, that must be my wife. Right. Just happened to be there in that moment. He would have found her regardless, but he like backs up in the street and then he, he just is himself, but in this new body. Right. He's like, yeah, rock and roll today. I was at the thing. I, you know, I'm the best cop ever. And he's, you know, um, I don't think at that point he knows that uh, the real Archer and his wife like have no like, you know, love life at all anymore. But he, you can easily assume it from the neighborhood, from her body language, from how she greets him. You know, oh, you were gone again for longer than you said. Yeah. And you said you would fix the gutters. Right. No, you won't do that. When are you going to be true to your word? And he's like, fuck all that shit. This is a new me. And of course, everybody likes the new him. It's utterly unbelievable. But he's got. The, the old him was the way he was because his son was killed by Nick Cage's character who sniped him on a merry-go-round, like in his arms. So, of course, he's fucked up, right? And he wants to get this guy. And then when he gets him, he wants to make sure that he's gone. I Also, I don't know why when he catches him, he doesn't just, he's not just eliminated on the spot. I mean, he's armed. He's done all these terrorist things. Oh, I guess because he's got to uh, find out where the bomb is. Okay, all right. Makes sense, but still, it's a plot hole that they always do, right? Um, but still, he's likable, and, you know, he changes everything. Uh, it's weird when he goes, he, you know, he goes and sees his daughter in her room. She's got, like, what are her posters on her wall? She's got, like, you know, mid to late 90s posters. She's got, like, a Creed poster, a Limp Biscuit poster, a Deftones poster, <laughs> a Lauren Hill poster, um... 311. She, I don't think she has any of those, but she does have, you know, posters all over her wall. She's on the phone. She's got a nose ring. She's smoking cigarettes in her bedroom. He walks in, he busts open the door, takes a cigarette. Oh, he's the cool dad. But then it, it, it's weird because when I, I remember watching this when I was a teenager and I'm, I'm her age, I think she's 1980 or a year older. And I was thinking like, damn, this girl's hot, you know, cause she's my age. And I was thinking, yeah, he's cool. He's the bad guy. But now when I watch it, of course, and I'm older, I go, what the fuck, dude? This is weird how they did this because she doesn't know that the guy in John Travolta's body is not her dad. She she thinks that's her dad. And go back and watch. Actually, don't go back and watch that scene. Just take my word. It's a weird scene what happens, right? Um, uh, but he ends up being... Um, a good uh, fake dad in one way because when... She comes home from her date and that 70s show dude who is like that in real life, apparently, right? What he does in the movie. Remember? Remember? Wasn't he uh, uh, coinvicted of those things in real life? And isn't that the that 70s show dude? The uh, uh, Manny Dasterson, right? The Scientologist. I think that's her date or at least a clone of him. And they show up and, you know, they're making out or whatever. And she's like, all right, I got to go. And he's like, no more, which is like, what the fuck? Who does this shit? 
no more. You're going to stay in the car in your driveway, your house. Very weird. So he comes out and, you know, whips this kid's ass, which is good. Right. Finally, you know, she sees that there's a dad who's there and he's strong. And right. And then when they go in the house, he does that cool thing. Do you have protection? And she's like, like, a you know, late nineties. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, here's my twisted, uh, shining butterfly knife that I pulled out of nowhere. Take this next time he tries anything, uh, jam it in his thigh and twist it. <laughs> and she looks up at it like it's a talisman and takes it, which is pretty cool. Um, because at that point, yeah, he's the bad guy and he's the villain, but Castor and Pollux have switched roles. So now he's in the overworld. So yes, he's mimicking the good guy with his still the spirit of bad guy. But at this point, you know, he wants to protect this girl. So that's, so that's a positive thing. That's good. Um, he tries to go all out and, uh, you know, take the wife and live that role. He tells, Oh, remember he tells his brother, uh, Pollux, no, we're going legit. And his brother's like, yeah, but what about all the money? And he's like, yeah, but think of all that, like, think of everything else that I could get that is, you know, think of all of the abstract stuff that I can get from this that will turn into concrete things, right? I'll get the fame. I'll be a hero. I can do whatever I want. I can run the department. I can catch the bad guys and be a black marketeer crook and still be pretty much still be a terrorist, right? Um, and it's, again, this is interesting because this is pre big nine. And one of the faults in not catching this guy is the, uh, is the fact that the inter there's no interagency communication. And remember that when big nine happened afterwards, that was one of the things that they pointed to. There was no uh, communication and everybody knew who, uh, uh, didn't Biden, uh, been, uh, where he been hiding, but they didn't communicate with each other. Even the Russians tried to tell us about it, but because of the lack of, you know, uh, we needed bigger government. We needed bigger intelligence. We needed more money, bigger budget, because then we would have been able to go, Oh, we got a phone call about this guy. We should have listened to him. <laughs> Meanwhile, of course, the truth was that they did know about him and they'd been running him for years and funding his, uh, his family's uh, firm and building the caves at um, Bora Tora, we'll say. And even, even senior was what having breakfast with him at the four seasons that morning before a matinee of Les Mis in New York. They were the only flight to take off that day, that year, that big event, regardless of all that. It's interesting that they bring that up in this film. That that's one of the things. Um, and the, actually the boss, John Travolta's boss uh, in the office is the old guy with the mustache. He's the one who plays general, general Marshall in, uh, Saving Private Ryan, remember, he shows up and he's like, to quote Abraham Lincoln, the angels of our better nature, go get those boys. Right? Sends him on the mission. Go get the boys, no matter what. No matter how many people got to die, you go get those brothers back, even though we just sent them there. Because one of them's Matt Damon. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Um, it, it, I'm sorry, but it's just crazy to think of the different angles and levels of propaganda pre big nine, um, post, uh, I guess post 91 world trade center event, right. Post, um, you know, f uh, end of the cold war, right. Pre, uh, war on terror. It is pretty crazy to think of the things. I mean, one more example, Arlington road. Have you guys seen that movie Arlington road, right? Which is Jeff Bridges and Tim Robbins. Have you guys seen that movie? It's a forgotten about movie. It is very well done. Very revelatory. It's um, based around the first big nine, right? When they did the one in the basement um, also involves uh, the, you know, usual citizen uh, secret domestic tourist, Kind of includes Ruby Ridge, OKC, all those elements in one. And is a movie that was well done enough to put into people's psyche in a very subtle way that, oh, these next door neighbors, they are the terrorists. Right? Because, spoiler alert, in the movie, the guy that they suspect, they are the guys. They are the bad guys. Um, and there's a kind of weird uh, eternal return in, 
in the within the movie. Very good movie. Um, maybe we should go back and do that sometime. It might be too spicy, but Arlington Road. <clears throat> I mainly remember it because it has Arlington in it, and that's Virginia. Um, okay, so first person Q said, who was the kid? Are you talking about the daughter in um, Face Off? If that's who you're talking about, I don't remember her name, and I just looked it up yesterday, but she's she's not really in anything anymore. I was thinking maybe it was Katherine Heigl, but she's she's the daughter in uh, My Father the Hero, with Gerard Depardieu. Um, poor Katherine Heigl. She was very, very pretty and very cute. I guess she was taken down by the all the BS or whatever. Um, the worst thing that can happen to you as an actor or in, you know, as anything in the entertainment industry is for you to be labeled as difficult. It's the absolute worst. If you're, if you're labeled as such, you won't work. Uh, no one will, no one will even look at you. They will turn you away immediately. They're difficult. They're difficult to work with. Okay, so, um, yes, Dominique Swain, that's it. All right, so, yeah, she's not really in anything. So, um, finally here, we have this movie called Gemini Man, which stars Will, William Smith and William Smith. And, again, this is a lot like um, Double Impact in that we have a – character playing himself but this one's different because the character that he's playing is is himself so in double impact uh jean-claude van damme plays his own twin brother and again it's pretty well done because you forget that that's one actor i mean you, you really do um which is interesting because that means that he's either a really great actor or kind of a low grade actor. And you just kind of sink into the movie. Either way, um, double impact is, is well done. Um, this movie, Gemini man, I don't know about the title. It's kind of too obvious, right? Because it involves a, a government project and intelligence sort of DARPA project with D the DIA. This movie actually has the DIA. It's interesting. Um, called Gemini. And, uh, it's run by Clive Owen. Clive Owen, who I love, I always like Clive Owen, plays the bad guy in this movie. And um, I don't know. He didn't get to do much in this. He plays a good bad guy. But Clive Owen's great, man. He's he's underrated and underused. I don't know what happened. I guess it might have been he started uh, doing movies uh, for a paycheck uh, with Chinese production companies. And then probably just got, you know, caught up in it. And it's hard to get uh, sort of normal work now. Of course, none of them are working now, so whatever. Clive Owen is great in Croupier. Have you ever seen Croupier? He's great in um, The International, uh, Sin City. What else? King Arthur. That King Arthur version was good. He's, he's great, man. He's a, he's a good actor. Uh, Oh, of course, Children of Men, his best movie, amazing movie. So, um, yes, it has the DIA, and this is, I don't know of many other movies that feature by name DIA. This is kind of like using the NSA in a, um, in, uh, what was it? Remember, we talked about NSA in the context of Condor, Three Days of the Condor, and then Condor the novel, and how they mentioned it by name in that, which was pretty revelatory for the time. People didn't really do that. Um. You know, CIA is the kind of go-to, but it's interesting that they use the DIA in this. And so there's a sort of a DIA DARPA project called Gemini in this, which is making uh, super soldiers. And these guys are supposed to be um, an anti-terrorist uh, sort of uh, Delta Force, very, you know, Delta Force to the max, um, e extreme counter-terrorist group that is... Mentioned as going, they're going to go on their mission into Yemen. They they mentioned Yemen a bunch of times, and they kind of uh, the context of the conversations that they have. Clive Owen makes it sound like this is the worst war zone in the world. This is a hell on earth, and so we need these guys to go in there with their you know surgical strike abilities and uh, 
take care of business. It's just it's just interesting because this is like tail end of the war on terror. And um, you remember when this was in the news all the time, this stuff with Yemen. And of course, you know, um, so far as we know, I mean, we got involved there at least with with drones and all that. I'm sure um, I'm sure that uh, SAS was there. I'm, you know, they had to have been. I know they were in Oman for years. Remember the movie Killer Elite and the book, which was written by Ray Fiennes' uncle, who was SAS and involved in that secret group, the Feathermen. Terrible name. Um, but he talks about that, and that's what the movie's about. That's a great movie. But this one is a uh, kind of DARPA-looking project where they've cl where they there are clones, and we don't actually get any indication there are clones until like a quarter of the way into the film. So the movie opens with uh, William Smith, and he's like, um, he's the uh, he's the Chris he's the Chris Kyle times a million sniper. This guy can uh, fire around; he can put around through a window into a, a Russian terrorist neck with a train going, you know, two hundred miles an hour from a million miles away on top of a mountain before it goes into a, a cave, like without even trying. This guy's the best. He's the best. He's the best uh, sniper. He's a liar. He's a liar. He didn't do that. He never showed up at that bar. All the things he said were lies. I was there. I was there. I rode with the Mongols. It was a club. Um, and we see his handler. His handler is a typical, you know, older, older, bald, you know, suited guy who says, you know, you got to do this. And he's got a, a partner on the ground who's giving, you know, feeding him coordinates and is actually on the train. And there's even one moment where the guy says, you know, uh, uh, halt, you know, yellow, yellow light, halt. There's a civilian and it's a little girl and she's in the way. Of course, she moves and he takes the shot anyway, but the little girl's like five feet away, he, like in just another seat. Like, what? It's it's uh, it's a it's a another weird sort of um, moral uh, issue that pops up for anyone with any kind of discernment, but it seems to be not one for uh, people that are you know, gung ho MIC uh, uh, Mark people, right? Okay, whatever. So the question: Why why didn't he just get on the train and do it? Right? Why didn't he do it before the train took off? Why didn't he do it after the train? Um, like. Why didn't they arrange for the guy to be in a private car on the train and then just drop a, a hellfire on top of it like they do with other stuff? It's, anyway, um, he snipes him through the neck, and, of course, the guy dies, and uh, he is told that this is the bad guy. Well, we're going to learn that, you know, this guy isn't actually the bad guy, bad guy. He's actually working for their side, and they're trying to tie up loose ends, and that's going to mean that they need to— also get rid of William Smith the way it always is. Oh, and by the way, this is his last job before the big retirement, of course. Um, and the retirement is going to go ahead because he says he's killed. He's, he's had 78 confirmed kills just working freelance with this guy. <laughs> 78. He says at some point, you know, that's, st that starts to kind of mess with your head at some point. Now, uh, another thing is we do get a lot of exposition in this, which is kind of cool because we learned that William Smith and all of the contacts that he has are all part of uh, the, what do you call it? The, the MRF, the Marine Reconnaissance Force. They're all, um, you know, a special, they're not technically, I guess somebody tell me, are these guys technically special forces? I know they're not in JSOC because the Marine uh, recon doesn't answer them they're their own thing but they're te basically they're all the same i mean i guess marines technically are kind of special forces themselves anyway it's like when people say oh he's a marine sniper well i get aren't technically all marines snipers they're all marks marksmen um differentiated from like the the average like army infantrymen if i'm talking total bullshit then let me know please but that's that's the way that i've come to understand it please let me know in the comments afterwards if you hear this what's the difference between uh marines you know marine snipers and marine you know average marine marksmen um but this guy is a like he's the sniper sniper i guess and he's got this uh marine recon you know ace of spades tattoo on his um inner arm and what's their what's their logo let me look up their logo So when you know, of course, when you see this, you go, "Oh well, th this is." They got a. They had to have gotten approval for this. 
And of course, it does them no harm um, to put it in the film because you know that somebody, somebody somewhere is going to watch this and they're going to go, oh, I want to do that. And then that's, they're going to get a recruit, right? Okay, I think this is it right here. This is one of them. Let me, let me show you this. See, first, I got to fucking download this. Oh, uh, no, that doesn't work. Um, because I'm too boomer tech to know how to just open the window on OBS the way that I have it. Let, let me try it. Let me try it. You know what? I'm going to try it. Give me one second. Window capture. Yeah, dude, I got it. I can't believe it. You guys. You guys, I made it work. All right, check this out. Yo. Yo, I made it work, you guys. Next, I'll be learning... Um, Windows 95. So that's, uh, you can see that Ace of Spades right there. And you see Silent Deadly Swift. You see that? So that's what he's got on his forum, which is pretty cool. I mean, it's, I know it's not worth going through all that, but it's just a pretty cool little small detail that they have, and that helps them identify. Now, this also ties into the nautical theme because um, one of the things that William Smith has nightmares about is uh, he's, like, falling off a boat, and he's underwater. He's looking up at the surface, and in his early nightmare, um, he looks up, and uh, and by boomer tech, by the way, I mean, basically, I'm over 40, so technically it's boomer tech. Right? It's a state of mind. Any uh, any Zoomer could probably do that in two seconds, so please don't, uh, you know, whatever. So so anyway, he's looking up at the surface, and he comes out, and he's obviously in this stage. He's a child because we see what would be his dad. We know it's his dad because he's got these kind of cool shades on, and he's got a little bit longer, you know, hair, and he's there with a woman who's going to be his wife, and the dad goes, you got to try, you know, try harder. You got to kick harder or something like that, and then he drops him, and so he goes underwater again, so he's teaching him how to swim, right? Then later, uh, later on in the movie, about halfway through, we see that he joined this elite, um, I guess, mm, I guess this is the mercenary group, or maybe this is the recon group that he was, that he joined. And the way that he was kind of initiated into this was um, the guy took him out there, put weights on his, on his feet and on his ankles, took him way out into the water and then dropped him overboard and said, um, you know, to, to tread water. And he tread water and tread water for hours and hours and hours until finally he um, he couldn't and he just dropped into the water and he drowned. And then they they dove in, pulled him back up, resuscitated him, and then they said, "Now you're you're ready, essentially, for this group. Um, you know, you've you've died and you've been born again into this elite squad. Which is um, who knows if this is accurate. I'm sure the spirit of this is accurate, right? This is why you know you have a hell week and. Uh, the seals and all that stuff, you go through hell and you're sort of reborn in, in the image that they want you to be born. And this is why, in, you know, the, the frats, right? In the frats, you do this sort of thing. Um, this is why the, the fraternity uh, rituals are based on the Masonic thing, right? Where you, you know, let the brother receive the light. And, you know, if you say anything, we'll cut off your head and stand on one leg and all that shit, right? Because you're born again into this thing of secrecy. Um, but when he's born into this thing, he thinks that he's serving uh, a noble cause and in his naivete. And, of course, he's later going to learn that a bunch of the people that he's been killing are just, they just told him a bunch of lies, you know. And so he he he, he kills this uh, final guy. He goes back to his house. Of course, he's got a great house. He's like Jason Statham in The Mechanic. He's got this cool house. It's on the water. They always have a house on the water. Uh, I recently watched The General's Daughter, which is a good movie with John Travolta and he lives in a houseboat on the water. He can always escape through the water. So he's living there, and um, and he's got a buddy played by Douglas Hodge, the Englishman, who went to RADA and all this stuff. Um, 
and he is a fellow, you know, they, they, they're a brotherhood basically and they help each other out and do this stuff. Um, and then he meets with his handler. His handler says, you know, we, we're, we're going to hate to see you go. You can't like, if you, if this was your life, you you don't go back to your little houseboat home and just chill and think that it's like wouldn't you go to your secret uh place you stashed away in like the, the fucking Swiss Alps for a week and chill and then use the rest of the money you stashed and go to Botswana like you you would move around right for a while and make sure everything was cool and they weren't trying to tie up their loose ends right wouldn't you do that You'd basically do a rat line paperclip and go to South America for, you, wouldn't you do that shit? You wouldn't just chill. Why would you trust them? Right? So they come after him. So Clive Owens like, look, man, we got, we got to take care of this guy because of whatever reason he's DIA and there's a woman involved. She's kind of a, a, uh, Hilario, um, Clinton character. We came, we saw he died. Let's just get rid of him. Right. And Clive Owen mentions he wants to put in place the Gemini project. He says, we don't need to do any of this shit. Don't send, don't send somebody who he's going to get rid of. This guy's the best. We need to send Gemini. So what's Gemini? Well, at first we think it's uh, this kind of SWAT team hit squad because they're doing psyops and war games in this kind of make-believe village. And there's crisis actors and they're, you know, pretending to get killed and it's paintball and Gemini's coming in to neutralize some terrorist target. But we obviously know from the damn movie poster that Gemini is going to be William Smith himself, but it's a younger version. So that's going to be, a, I mean, you guess right away, this is going to be a clone, but the reasons for the clone are interesting because we learned that Clive Owen cloned William Smith because he's the best of the best. He's the absolute, he's the best of America, right? He killed the aliens as a fighter pilot. Um, he was funny. Um, he was a cop in Miami. Um, he, what else did he do? He was alone at the end of the world. Like he did all this shit. So of course they're going to clone William Smith. Um, I didn't know that, uh, William Smith was going to go to MIT before he took the role of Fresh Prince. Did you know that before he became an actor? Um, I don't, I, I guess he was going to study engineering. I know Will Smith can solve a Rubik's cube in like two seconds. I've seen that, but is that, is that, uh, MIT shit? I don't know. Whatever, man. I also know that his first role was in the movies was Skittles. You remember that? His very first role. Regardless, all right. That's I'm sure that's how he got into it. Um, how they gave him his roles. But regardless of that, they cloned him and they make a younger version of him who's faster, stronger. He, I don't get tired. He doesn't get tired, and he looks exactly like William Smith has the same voice and he chases him, but for some reason they can't figure out for half the movie that they are clones of each other. They're literally talking and yelling at each other and they see each other's faces, but they don't recognize themselves. If you saw yourself, if you saw your doppelganger, which is you, right? Remember we did Steppenwolf, we did Poe, we did William Wilson. If you see yourself, like in the movie Enemy by Denis Villeneuve, wouldn't you right away totally freak out and glitch out and like do a, you know, a total Britney in that interview? You'd be like, you, you, you're seeing yourself. You would recognize yourself. You remember, as it says in Julius Caesar, you never see yourself, but in a mirror, but you, if you saw yourself, you would freak out. I've seen people that kind of look like me before sort of look like me. And it's enough to go. That's, this is weird. I don't want to, I don't want to even get close to this person. That's very weird. I don't want anybody to say, oh, you two look alike. You know, people, everybody, you know, kind of looks like so we see that all the time with celebrities, but they look exactly alike. So then they're thinking, oh, uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, you know, the, the, the woman that he meets at the dock or whatever, who turns out to, of course, be a DIA snitch um, who's there to watch him. Um, he's very good at sourcing her out too, by the way. Uh, he asks her questions and her answers just, you know that she is what he thinks she is. So she's like, you don't, you don't remember having a kid like anywhere. And his answers are weird. Cause he's like, no, I've never had even the opportunity to have had a kid before. So it's like, dude, you're like 50 something. That's a weird answer also. And then that plays into when he talks to his, when he, he treats him as his son, but it's actually him cloned later in the movie and he's like you're 24 and you're a you're a you're a v card you're just like me 
And you're like, what? What is this? So I guess he's supposed to be the pure warrior, right? He gave everything for his country and then later his uh, mercenary activity or his, you know, JSOC, whatever. Um, and he never even had a girlfriend or anything, even though he asked out the girl. And he's, he kind of he kind of got some riz there, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, and she, she actually goes out with him because it's William Smith. But then... At the end of the movie, spoiler, does he get the girl? Um, I don't think they ever make out in this movie. I don't think they kiss. So it's kind of Tom Coomish because they don't kiss. Um, and But he does take himself at the end of the movie, who is his clone, it's him, uh, off to some you know unnamed Ivy League college. And his son, his self-clone son, is going to go major in computers or whatever. But it's also weird because... The clone was made to be the alpha winter soldier super killer of all time. And he didn't have parents. His his surrogate dad was Clive Owen. He didn't have a mother. He's totally psycho. Um, he he like he he killed a lot of people. That was his whole life. So what? Now he's just gonna go off to college? Okay, well, I guess it'll be Sung Wee Cho. Um, that's a dark reference, if you get that. Uh but seriously, it's weird, right? The cloning thing is, you know, in this movie is interesting because the way that they discuss it is as if it's the easiest thing. Um, and it makes you wonder, uh, you know, how how far along they are with this. I, I don't I don't put any stock in like, you know, the the celeb clone thing is interesting. I don't think that's beyond the realm of possibility, but I'm not sure about it. I think it's more like just actors and lookalikes. Um, you know, like uh, the football guy that got hit in the heart, you know, and the stabby and all that, and then has a clone. I I don't know. Remember, uh, the movie Us was about that. Um, Jordan Peele movie Us, his sequel to Get Out, which. If you saw the trailer for that movie when it first when the trailer first came out and they have the rabbits, um, I don't know anybody who didn't predict what the movie was going to be about like right away. Everybody in our sort of circle saw that trailer and immediately got it like right away, right? Um, uh, it's kind of the same as with like the Chaos Manson book. It's like I'm reading it and even the new things that I'm finding – are things that I've, for the most part, heard spoken before. But, you know, the shocking things in it, the details aren't shocking because I'm coming on upon something new. They're shocking because it just reinforces what we've already heard through, you know, about Lewis, Jolly, and West and these people. So my point is that at this point, all of the stuff that is thrown at us, um, even the so-called new information and, the new, the, you know, the, the new stuff that they put out, um, new revelations, new white papers. It's like, at this point, there's not really anything that I think any of us should hear or see that we didn't expect. Does that make sense? Um, I don't know what you guys think about it. But put your ideas in the chat. Let me know. I mean, like, for instance, you know, with Karanka, when Karanka first happened, when Karanka first happened, you know, um, is when, for instance, is when Jethro and I were talking all the time. And when that happened, it was like, I think for both of us, it was like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, FEMA zone six, 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 you know, a total, uh, dystopian wasteland out there, Mad Max. Um, this is what's going to, you know, it's, this is going to happen. And then it was like, Oh, then they're going to bring the stabby. It seems obvious. The lockdowns will bring the stabby. And then, uh, everybody's been, you know, um, entombed in their pod for so long that the summer is going to have some kind of burning, right? And then that's that's what happened. I remember when Jethro and I were listening to um, Whitney Webb, and she mentioned the dual uh, E L E C T O R system that was in one of the white papers, and exactly what would happen in January of that next year, and that's exactly what happened. So, you know, I just don't I don't um, see any. Uh, you know, this terrible thing with the, that just happened to the B I G G S fella. That's, you know, it's like there are people that have done far 
that have done other things that are far worse that are in for a lo way longer. And obviously, this is a statement, and you knew this was coming. And that that all that makes it even worse, really. But it's like, are we? I don't know. Are you guys surprised by any, any of this shit anymore? I mean, we're about to enter the 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 season, right? You can feel it in the psychosphere that everybody's bringing up the the Karanka thing again, right? People are starting to wear the thing. They're talking about it. They're implementing it. Lionsgate Cinema just, you know, made that a rule. The governors are all giving statements. You know, the the schools are all talking, you know, mentioning it. Um, they're not mentioning how they all got the uh, the stabby and it's, you know, all that stuff. But they're mentioning it. So I I tend to think, oh, this is, hopefully they don't, but this seems to be coming back. Um, I hope not, y'all. I I don't want to talk too much about that because that's a total, you know, that's totally off topic. Uh, but I don't know. In a way, it's not it, because look, and this is a this is a very like it's a pretty esoteric reading of events tied in with what we're talking about here. But in a way. It's like in Apocalypse Now, the Redux, when the woman says to um, Willard, you see there are two of you, one that loves and one that kills. There, there are two of people, right? And the Karanka thing made us see all the people that their inner self came out and we saw what people believed in, what they, what they held dear, if anything, and what their sort of values and system was. Just, and without even judgment, without judgment, without judgment, just seeing that. So why would we think that it would be different for the next time? Or that the next time would be further off, or that it wouldn't come at all? I mean, I just, I hate to like blackpill people, but I just don't think that, the, especially those people, what like they learn something like they they the the new info that comes out about the harm of the face thing right like that's going to change anybody no i mean it's it's of course not so that sucks but um i don't know jc says they work like a bow constrictor they squeeze and let off some and squeeze each time getting tight uh oh yeah and uh, look um who's this um Who's this, Tabio? Tabio says, Dolly is a pretty symbolic name, knowing what we know about uh, MK mind-controlled uh, things. Well, yeah, it's, oh, thank you for reminding me about Dolly because they bring that up in the film, in the Gemini uh, Man film, is the Will Smith, Ang Lee, Jerry Bruckheimer film. They bring that up um, when they're talking about the cloning because they say, look, um, Will Smith goes to talk to this, who is it, like a, I guess it's a, a Russian, of course it's like a Russian scientist, or an expert um, who knows about all the stuff Will Smith is involved in, but is kind of, he's uh, aloof now. He's away from it, kind of like Zaroff in Most Dangerous Game. He's doing his own thing over there. Um, but he basically says, look, you know, yes, they of course they can do this. Dolly was like 1996, right? They, they, they lab grew printed a damn uh, soy sheep in 1996 that bod for however long it lived, right? In a like hellish agony, I'm sure. Nevertheless, they did that. You know, look, they've got uh, they've got human animal chimeras gestating on U.S. research farms. Have you ever heard of a a mix between a rhesus monkey and a and a and a octopus? Or a, a sheep and a and an arachnid spider guts. They're laser printing human animal pig chimeras. But like, I mean, are they? <laughs> There's a new it's not new, but it's a show that I was watching last night on Netflix called uh Sweet Tooth that somebody recommended um I think yesterday. Because of the most dangerous game thing. And I watched two episodes of it and I went, yeah, of course. Right? It's human animal chimeras 
in a uh, post-apocalyptic dystopian world. It's been destroyed by a Karanka event, right? People are getting the stabby. It seems that the stabby or whatever it was created the human-animal chimeras, and then everybody's hunting them, and you're like, well, if this is the case, are the bad guys really the bad guys? What are these things? But then they speak, so it seems that they're human, and so, so of course they're the bad guys are the bad guys, but then there's a uh, there's a big guy who's a, just like um, Stan Smith in that episode of American Dad, the 200, where he's basically reliving the the road. Cormac McCarthy's the road, even with the pon the green poncho and the rifle and the tattoos. It's the same exact thing, same trope. Um, but I mean. I don't know. I just worry about this stuff. I'm not worry because what's there? What can we worry about? Um, Marshall perspective. Marshall says, "Thank you, sir. Appreciate you and all your support." Says, "Always great content." Your I'm going to read this here because I can't see it on the, the chat. Never loaded here. Let me read it here. Your PT Anderson masterclass was awesome. Get yourself a pack of Cowboy Killers or a few things off the base dollar menu. BLA. Thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate that. Um, Ace of Bazed. Really appreciate you, sir. I was listening to Ace of Bass earlier. Underrated. Two hit wonders. Jeff said, dang, I forgot. I didn't know they were hot back then. <laughs> so true. Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Really appreciate that. Thank you for that four ninety nine. You guys, look, if you want to super chat, if you want to support me, you can do that um, with the links right here at the bottom. Um, I don't turn that the uh, ADS on because um, they go yellow because of what we talk about here. Literature has spicy content, and they the the uh, robotoids don't know the difference between that and like someone giving opinions about um, stuff and you know advocating for it or whatever. Um, I don't know, but they don't like that, so I don't turn them on. Also, when you turn on the stream and like there's ads, it's an, it's kind of annoying, but. And we have a small enough channel where we don't, you know, we don't have to do that. So maybe one day I'm going to look, I promise I'm going to do the memberships one of these days. Uh, at this point, it would just, I, I just need to get going. Um, help me think of some names for the membership levels, right? I mean, five bucks will be, you know, basement breathalyzer, right? What will 10 bucks be? Um, Ace of based. What will what will twenty bucks twenty buck membership be? Will that be uh, Bodie Bodie level uh, point break? <laughs> Johnny Utah uh, Bodie, give me two. Um, what will a ten thousand dollar a month membership get you? That that will get you me going to wherever you are, and uh, and uh, personally delivering you a copy of the book that you have always wanted, and uh, giving you a. a a, pr a special class on uh, Shakespearean analysis. <laughs> I don't know. I saw the thing. The guy was um, put an ad on Craigslist for like, he was, he was a professional crier at funerals. The top level was I will, uh, I will fight off uh, members of your family who get mad when I jump in and into the casket and cry. <laughs> I was like the $10,000 level. Um, so yeah, let me know some level names, right? Um, Nick, Nick over at, um, at, uh, Sam's channel. They got cool names for their membership levels, right? Severe beast. We could be beast coast, beast coast, southerner beast coast. Based Michigander. Um, okay. So. Yes, and if you want me to cover anything, please um, don't forget to drop me an email or drop me a fat chat or a super chat. Also, I need to give some um, shouts out to people who have supported. I know, I know this one is kind of a just a, a babble, kind of a, I don't know, what do you call this? I'm thinking of the word psycho babble. I watched so many movies this weekend, just in the background. Um, I watched A Few Good Men for like the millionth time. What about you, Weinberg? Code, honor, loyalty. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall for you to laugh at at cocktail parties. Although my presence 
however grotesque. Jason sends seven bucks. Appreciate you, Jason, as always. And thank you for all of your hard work and your support. Appreciate you. Malaforta uh, sends a uh, book, coffee, uh, cowboy killers, emojis, and sends, what is this? Sends five bucks. Appreciate you, Malaforta. Thank you so much. Um, shouts out to my homeboy, um, A.H., I'll say, A.H., my homeboy, A.H., I.R.L., who sent um, a big, big, fat super chat in support. I really appreciate that. Really appreciate my I.R.L. longtime homeboys uh, checking out this and supporting me. I really appreciate that. He's a very successful fella and an old friend, so I really appreciate that. Um, also, let's see. Shouts out to um, our... Thumbnail artist, he, not for this one because I, did, I didn't have time to get in touch with him, but for all our other thumbnail art, um, please go to IPAC Arts, I P A K dot arts um, over on Instagram. And uh, you can see his details over there. He does amazing thumbnails for JD, for uh, DPH, um, for Sam Tripoli, for a bunch of people. He's uh, prolific. Yo, shouts out to, let me see this person's name before I drop it. I don't want to give the shouts out to JG on PayPal who sent 20 bucks after that last stream. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Oh yeah. And shouts out to, um, uh, Kat Owen who sent, that's what she goes by on YouTube. So I feel okay saying that who sent five bucks after that last stream on PayPal. Really appreciate you. Thank you for your support. It means so much to me. That's from Andy. Just going through these. Um, sometimes people send them and they don't get to me till just after. Oh, yeah. Shouts out to, let's see, uh, Jeb, who sent five bucks. I don't think I got to that last time. He sent five bucks and said, Dono, thank you so much, Jeb. Really appreciate you. Oh, yeah. And I didn't get to Evan last time either. He sent it um, just at the end. Evan, he said, hi, Bass. You're my favorite person on YouTube. I'm broke right now, but starting a business. I hope it goes well so I can send fat chats. Hey, listen, man, thank you so much. You're starting a business, and you took the time to send me five bucks. That's a, that's a hard-earned five bucks, and I really appreciate that so much. It's hard to, definitely hard to make a buck. So thank you, Evan, um, longtime supporter. Really appreciate that, and I hope your business succeeds and blooms and blossoms and booms, and it goes well, and you have no period of struggle, and you, it gets going right away. Um, if you want to later, tell us what your business is and maybe we can, you know, if it's got a link or anything, I don't know. If you don't want to dox yourself you can put that out there. Send me an email, madmaximalism 2 xs at gmail.com. Um, I think that's it for that support. Okay. So let's see how long we've we been going. We're we going, dang, almost three hours. All right. So look, uh, the Gemini arch uh, archetype. So what's there left to say? I mean, look, a deep reading of the Gemini um, and, and avoiding the sort of low-hanging fruit of the uh, astrological stuff. I'm not saying that that's... I'm, I'm just saying we're sort of avoiding that because it's kind of... We all know about that, right? Um, but the twin archetype or even the twin motif uh, becomes this constant through-line theme in films. And in Gemini Man, again, what happens is that the guy is the hit man of all time. He's the alpha, and they clone him, and then they send his clone after him. And then, of course, there's going to be another clone that pops up that they're going to have to they, – they, they actually eliminate. And then the question becomes, well, how many are there? And he's like, well, there's only three. So then it's like, well, we need to get rid of Clive Owen, right? And – the young William Smith doesn't want to do it because that was his sir. That was his dad. He told him he was his dad all these years. So of course, older William Smith does it. He smokes him. Right. And then he becomes the dad essentially to himself, which is very strange. Um, yo, tro trope says, sends five, $5, five, uh, green coin and says, love the channel. Cheers. Hey, thank you so much. I love that. You love the channel. Cheers to you. Cheers. Cheers to you. You see, David, you see David Ake on that plan coming back from Belfast? I wonder if he was doing a talk there. And then they had all that trouble, trouble going into Gatwick. 
Yeah, it's on Jethro's uh, Instagram. Check out Homeboy Jethro on Instagram. And he put up the meme of uh, that back there is not real. What do you guys think of that? I mean, now it's like, okay, so what? She's a PR, you know, psyop or some shit. Um, I don't think that the whole thing is like that. I mean, all these continuous, you know, freakouts on airplanes are, uh, I think for the most part, a lot of those are organic. At least the fights are, um, somebody, who was it? Uh, my homeboy Blotsky today mentioned something about, um, the strikes. Was there like a strike at Dunkin' Donuts? I'm behind. I'm behind on stuff. Was there a strike at Dunkin' Donuts or something? People were walking out. Are there strikes happening now everywhere? Is this spreading? What is this? Is this is this part of the uh, coming uh, cyber polygon? Tell me if there are strikes everywhere. Um, obviously, the thing in Hawaii, um, Kutsky, uh, Maddie, real Cooter Brown, Digital Minefield uh, did a talk on how Canary Islands um, seem to be a practice or a preliminary Maui event, and that one was confirmed. Um, our our song, they actually confirmed it. I keep seeing things about the smart cities in Maui. Um, thankfully, I don't think people are going to let that go. Um, talked about that in depth on Boiler Room, so I won't get into that too much. Uh, Moldy lives in the Himalayas. Do you live in the the uh, monast the Buddhist monastery where Ace Ventura goes? Slinky, slinky. Um, let's see. Tapio says, what up, Kang? Ever read Imperium by Yaki? Crazy book. Takes after Spangler. Lots of stuff I dis disagree with, but some good stuff, too. No, who's Yaki? Who's Yaki? Is that like, uh, Yaki? Yaki Smirnov? In Russia, you, you uh, ride horse. In America, horse ride you. Seven years in Tibet. Seven years in Tibet is uh, not Herman Hesse. It's, um, hi, who's, oh, my God. Too many names, dude, with H's. Henley. Seven years in Tibet is uh, Heinrich. Who is that? Heinrich. Uh, Heinrich Herr. And then who is Yaki? Uh, what's this? Who's this? Oh, Francis Parker Yaki. Hmm. Influenced by Spangler and Evola. No, I've ne I, no. Of course, I'm Wikipedia. So I've never yet. I've never uh, yed Yaki before. Was an oh an American oh that thing. Okay, uh, a lawyer. He's known for his neo Spang. Uh, Imperium the fossil. No, I've never read Imperium. Um, but I will check it out. Also, of course, in terms of philosophy, um, I, I'm only uh, read up on philosophy in the most basic, almost slow boy way. I mean, of course, I took philosophy classes in college and university, and I've read, you know, Aristotle and Plato, and I've read um, the architectonic plan and Kant and I've read uh, I've read Spangler. I've got a copy of Spangler in there. I've read Spinoza, uh, Heidegger, um, Kierkegaard. I've got a book over there of no, what is it? I got a book. Oh, where's that book I just bought? Um, somebody's poetics. Hold on, I think it's Heidegger. Hold on. Okay, well, now I can't find it. Oh, here it is. Yes, it's Heidegger. Let me put my little earphones in again. Hold on. Um, yes, this is Heidegger. 
It is uh, Poetry, Language, and Thought by Heidegger. I'm interested to read that. Um, and I've got Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom. But yeah, in terms of philosophy, um, I'm, I'm no philosopher. We know who the philosophers are in our circles, of course. J.D., D.P.H., uh, Chasky, who can make their way through philosophy and uh, difficult le levels of, again, I like to say the architectonic plan because it's such a, a fun word to say. It sort of clips off the tongue in a, in a cacophonous rhythm. But that right there is an example of why I'm more of a literature person than a, a philosophy person, unless it's, you know, unless it's part of the narrative or part of the poem. But um, what did Auden say? Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. I, you know, that's about as far as I go with philosophy, um, except for absorbing it. So, yes, but um, I will check out Yaki. I will read more into Yaki. I've got a, 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 no, an Evola book in there somewhere. Um, and I remember reading about Evola from my dad knows uh, my dad can he's adapted all ranges of literature and history. So he knows Evola. Um, and again, here's the book that I'm currently reading, which is why I was late from the six o'clock original time for this, because I was reading this book and got caught up in it. And that is Chaz Manson, uh, CIA and the secret history of the sixties. And again, like, I don't usually recommend books. You know, I don't. Um, but I will say, if I was going to recommend a book that, you know, I enjoy reading um, history and not true crime. We've, we haven't done much true crime here. We did a little bit. And, of course, we did. We talked about Fatal Vision, which is uh, one of the first true crime books. That was on Jeffrey McDonald and the Green Beret uh, murders at Fort Bragg that went in. You know, who was part of that? Um, uh, Ted Gunderson, remember, had a role in all that. And, of course, now... I've gone through phases about that case with, Ted, you know, about what Ted Gunderson said. And now I'm like, no, he was totally right about everything. Um, but Helter Skelter was the, is the magnum opus of true crime books. You know, Bugliosi's Helter Skelter. If you haven't read that book um, and you're in the, you're interested in that sort of thing, you, you should read that, but you should start with that book. This book, on the other hand, um, if you're not like, well versed in the the sort of cadence and terminology of uh the con conspiracy uh, history and stuff like on a pretty deep level then you should probably start with um helter skelter first because this one it's interesting that constantly what happens is tom o'neill keeps reiterating that he doesn't want to he's obviously when he was writing the book he was not um he knew the uh we'll call them CTs. He was aware of them and he knew them, but he was careful not to go into that sort of realm because he was trying to be an objective sort of dispassionate, you know, data driven journalist with sources and talk to the people like, like he's supposed to be, I guess. But then what ends up happening is he can't help, but get sucked into it. And he also finds that a lot of the um, areas that he goes into have already been uh, researched to the maximum extent by those people. So like, for instance, he'll come across somebody and he'll be like, yeah, this, this dude was like a real, he came off as like a real crackpot and he seemed homeless and you know, he was just seemed schizophrenic, but I, I can't help but admit that everything he told me later turned out to be true. And it was totally corroborated everything dealing with like, for instance, the uh, intelligence ties or the, there's so many levels to this. Have you guys read this? Have you read Chaos? Of course, it's named for the CIA's project, Chaos, uh, which was running concurrent with COINTELPRO. Um, it's, it's the only thing, this, I'll finish up talking about this book now with the fact that the only thing that annoys me about the book is that he mentions um, how, like, for instance, sources aren't cited in things and he has trouble following up on things, but then he himself will oftentimes not actually cite a source. So, like, he'll give a quote from a person about something, but it's not a well-known quote and it's obscure. But then when you look in the notes, it's just like he'll, he'll give an anecdote about it. He won't actually say where it comes from.
he won't give a publication or a person or a, and that 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 irks me because with a book like this I know that the conclusions that I come to are going to I'm going to take a lot from the book which I kind of already we already are on that track anyway you know that this was a larger thing and that it wasn't what it seems and it was intelligence and MK Ultra, all that stuff but dude put the sources man you know, you can't make that mistake in a book like this. And maybe I'm missing something. Maybe he did that because this turns into a sort of pseudo gonzo work where he's talking more about the process of finding this stuff. Cause it took him like 30 years to research this and he missed his deadlines year after year. And it became this long lifelong thing, but still that annoys me, you know, just, just with this book. Um, you know, whereas, like, when you read uh, Talbot's, um, uh, yeah, The Devil's Chessboard, which is completely different but deals with some of the same stuff. It's just basically about uh, Dulles and CIA and all that. The The end notes are so extensive, you know, they're, they're, it's very well done. Um, so two different books, and it's kind of not really fair to compare. It's sort of apples and oranges, but still, you know, that's that's got to be a thing. This is, that's a must. In a way, it's like writing a novel or a poem and having a spelling error in there, a punctuation error. You can't do that. It seems so small, but it's such a big deal, right? Um, JD, no, JD, JD's citations are great. JD's work is is great. It's well, it's well sourced. It's well written. Um, he needs to do a third one, Esoteric Hollywood Three. JD's philosophy, of course, and his essays are. Uh, par excellence. Um, I've spent so much time. I mean, I, I must, uh, I'm not bragging folks and it seems kind of spurgish, but I, I'm very, I'm well versed on JD's uh, essay work on his website. Uh, in fact, you bring up the thing and I can go to the thing exactly in the paragraph, but that's kind of the same with all literature. Um, I just have a memory for that. I'm not bragging, but seriously, you know, that's, it's so well done. And uh, th that would be a great place to start for anybody because if you didn't know this, Esoteric Hollywood deals with all of this entire subject and goes into the tangents and the connections. It's very well done. Um, get it from his website. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, so I guess just to tie all this up, um, Gemini Man, Face Off, and... Uh, what was the first one we did? Um, and Double Impact. All are about the twins, the Gemini twins. And this is a th this is these are only three examples. If we're going to do more figurative examples, we could talk about like Point Break comes to mind. I mean, Johnny Utah and Bodhi are kind of Gemini. They're basically the same age, the same height. One's like the straight world. The, he's a FBI and he was a lawyer. And, you know, Johnny Utah gets his guy. I can't handle the cage, man. The other one's Bodhi, who's like abstract. And, you know, he's a bank robber in the underworld. Right. He, he by the way, he they synthesize this when they both go up and they skydive. So they're both in the sky simultaneously. They sort of unite. They literally, you know, they unite each other's hands in this sort of circle in the sky when they do that. Um, but they're not brothers. They're not related, but they are two sides of a coin. And at the end, you know, he lets him go, right? Cliff's on both sides, man. I'm going to paddle to New Zealand. And then he, and then, of course, Johnny Utah throws his badge in the water. There's a nautical theme again with Gemini. Um. So in a figurative way, the Gemini twin is an archetype because it's just when a person sort of meets someone who has all the characteristics of themselves, but they are complete opposites. And the, the conflict comes when either they are a conflict, you know, they're against each other and they have to find some medium or one, one will succeed. Like, it, you know, Edith Hamilton was talking about one is in the heavens, one is in the underworld, and then they switch places. Or they work together for some common goal. Um, or one uh, dies and the other um, pursues him to the underworld or to the afterlife because he is in shambles, right? He can't live without his twin. His, 
the mirror of himself. So we can see this literally or figuratively. They both ex exist at the same time in the same place, or they are complete opposites. That's a, that's a big sort of, that's a big span in terms of an archetype, but it's one that clearly is present in so much literature and film just as two examples, right? Um, you know, in movies we often, you, well, we used to hear them say things like, you know, we're, we're the same, man. We're basically the same. Or like, um, you know, Vader and Luke. Right, we can join forces. One is from the dark side, one's from the light side. They're father and son, but they're, I mean, and, and Luke has a twin, right? Luke and Leia, complete opposites from different worlds, right? But in the end, they, and they're not in the same place at the same time until they need each other. They sort of synthesize, they get together. She rescues him. And then they're going to do whatever for the empire, right? So it's also interesting how the twins multiply. Like there's a sort of multiplicity. And that, of course, happens in Gemini Man. Um, okay, y'all, that's about it for tonight. I'm, I'm beat. I hope everybody had a great weekend, got lots of rest, or got out there and saw their family and friends. Um, let me check one more time. Let me, uh, let me check. Oh, am I still in the window? No. Although we've only been here, um, you know, I guess twice in one week, um, we've been doing a lot of content in other places as well. So please check out the links. And honestly, the best place to follow me if you want to see more content is um, on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram if you ha haven't already. Yo, shouts out to Moldy for 11 bucks. She sent on Dono Chat, if you could trade faces with Klaus, what would you do first? Are you talking about Barbie? <laughs> um, are you talking about uh, Schwabsky? If I could trade faces with Schwabsky, the first thing I would do is um, I would say we're implementing Cyber Polygon, but it's not what you thought. A cyber Polygon is now a program of getting rid of every uh, interest in the uh, globism, and we're going to use all of our funds uh, to uh, feed every feed every child, and uh, and uh, that's it. it. All of this is over. Everyone go home. I don't know. What would you do? That's uh, I put on that um, I put on that galactic Leonard Nimoy suit for sure. Um, first person Q sends five bucks and says, great stream, bud. Uh, and a great stream, bud backwards. Okay. Thank you, homeboy. Appreciate you. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones sends 10 bucks and says, we all appreciate what you do, brother. Hey, thank you, Tommy Jones. Appreciate you. Thank you for that $10 dono chat. Really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, this one was kind of a spur of the moment day one day, uh, thing. And with just some light reading and a couple of films. Um, again, we need to do a full on Jean Claude Van Damme. Um, and we probably need to have a, a guest host for that one. Um, if you want to see me do, for instance, like Snowpiercer, uh, Hesher, and, you know, express some interest in that. If you want to get guests on here, if you want anybody to come to the channel, let me know. Let them know. Tell them to reach out to me. Give them my email, Mad Maximal. I mean, do I need to put it in here for you guys? Even I wrote it wrong, dude. Come on, man. There we go. There's my email. Send that to them. Um, let's see. Let me check Super Chats one more time. I mean, I wouldn't think everybody would be on the internet tonight. So I don't know what the deal is. Yo, um, yeah, so Circle G also, all right, sent five bucks. 
Uh, Doritos, Coca-Cola, Face Off is on HBO Preview Weekend. Life is great. Yes, 1998 was great. 1999 was also spectacular. Um, one of my old friends reached out and wanted to maybe collaborate somehow on doing something for my, I got my 25th um, high school, uh, private school, prep school reunion this year in May. So always great content, Marshall says. Your PT Anderson Masterclass was awesome. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Trev says, love the channel. Cheers and sends five bucks and Tapio sends five bucks. What up, Kang and the Imperium comment. All right, listen, thank you so much for your support, guys. Um, and listen, if you want to support me, if you're watching this later, you can do so by smashing that like for one. That's like huge. That really does matter. And it gets the algorithm going. You can share this on any platform. You can share it with your family and friends in real life. Tell them to subscribe. It's so hard for people to hit the subscribe button. I'm not being facetious. Like, it is hard for people to do that. People still don't even have YouTube accounts at this point. So that means a lot. Um, make sure that you're subbed and you hit that bell, the notification bell. Everybody here has got their notification bell on for sure. Um, and uh, you can support me with Cash App, PayPal, Venmo, anytime. You can give me... Uh, ideas for the pan stream in the comments afterwards and you can tell me um what things you want me to cover so i appreciate it y'all thank you so much i love y'all and thank you for bearing with me for the tech problems and we will be back uh sometime later this week appreciate y'all all right peace